after slipping into a coma from a particularly savage villain attack following an equally savage beatdown from one Katsuki Bakugo it's a full year before Izuku awakens from his coma. Who could imagine that in that year-long coma Madraya spent a full 18 years in another world? What happens when Izuku comes back with his training and knowledge? When society isn't quite as perfect as he, remembers? The world isn't a kind place. The world isn't even a fair place. Things happen because someone or something, somewhere, pushed them to happen. Be it the weather destroying coastline with floods and ceaseless waves or a criminal absconding with his loot leaving the battered and broken behind him. There is a reason that all things happen. One Madraya is Yuku had learned that lesson long, before this point and wasn't surprised to be learning the lesson once again. One of their own had betrayed them. A member of the defense militia that was defending the Elysium installation had tipped the Furians to their base of operations and their plans. Perhaps the refuge hadn't been with them from the beginning and was merely a wolf in sheep's clothing all along biding their time until they, could ruin the hopes and dreams of the resistance. The captain had always told him that he was too soft towards the rescued civilians. Perhaps she was right on that front. Regardless of what might be the case, now was neither the time nor the place for debates on his actions and the morality of them. The installation was still under assault, and until all of the civilians had made it through the, gateway, they couldn't risk falling back from their positions. It was going to be a long day. They were running low on supplies and except for a handful of the defense militia and the four remaining members of the Black Cats, they were low on manpower as well. The Furians were pushing them back steadily towards the command center and it was only a matter of time before their defensive line was, broken through. The civilians were, finally, almost through the gateway and they would soon be able to blow the installation, leaving nothing but the ashes of the installation in a smoking crater for the Furian High Command to sift through. Stuart, Midraya called out over the roar of gunfire, bullets ricocheting off the tunnel walls and filling the air with dust. We don't have all day here, get those charges set. We need to pull back. Unless you want me to set off the facility charges with these and blow us all to hell and back, you'll have to give me a damn second. Stuart shouts back to Midraya, sweat beating on his brow, a bullet pinging off the barricade he was hidden behind to finish the wiring and done we're all clear sir everyone pull back to the command center midraya gave the orders with a practiced precision that came from his years as the second in command of the black cats go stuart i'm covering midraya popped his head and rifle out around the corner of the barricade long enough to place several rounds down the hallway the Furian soldiers were forced back around the corner lest they take even more losses to their already mounting death Toll. Those that weren't lucky enough to step back in time didn't have to worry about anything ever again. Midraya took the momentary abatement of gunfire to sprint back around the corner, bullets once again raining down around them, and gave Stuart the signal. There was a single moment after that before the explosion went off and the tunnels rumbled almost as if the very mountain was going to come down on their heads in retribution for their actions. The rumbling stopped and everyone took a much-needed breath. That will buy us a few minutes while they reroute troops or try to get through the rubble, he muttered. Striding down the tunnel to the command center, Midraya was struck by a sense of nostalgia. It had been only a couple years since the Black Cats had found the long-abandoned, underground installation, but in those years they had certainly called it home and not just their base of operations. The labs where he spent countless hours working on both research and the squadron members' augmentations. The armory where the members not only trained but maintained their gear. Even the living quarters held memories, despite how little time any of them spent there. It is certainly, going to be strange to say goodbye to her. But in the end, it's the start of a new beginning. At least those damn Thurians won't be getting her. Midraya walked into the command center and looked around for the captain. The command center was densely packed with electronics. Charts of statistics and graphs of operations lined the walls and a main bank of systems lined one wall just in front of, thick plate glass windows that overlooked a glowing sparking gateway through which a plane filled with refugees could be seen. 
Spotting the captain behind the main system overlooking the gateway, he stepped over and placed his hand on her shoulder. How's the evacuation going Rose? Better or worse than we hoped? Better, I would say. There was a hint of a musical lilt to Rose's voice when she, spoke, each word subtly hinting at the origins of her upbringing. Madraya would have smiled at that lilt. That would be the case were he not familiar with her inflections. As it was, he ended up with a noticeable crease forming in his brow and his mouth turning down into a frown. What's wrong? I know that tone and I know there is a but coming. Nothing major is wrong. We just sent the last of, the supplies we stockpiled through the gate. The field is destabilizing, however, and I'm worried they won't end up where we sent them. Rose spoke softly just to Madraya, being careful that the second part wasn't overheard. They had enough to worry about without adding the morale of the remaining members of the defense militia onto the pile. We can worry about it later. At least the supplies, are on the other side. If that's everyone and everything accounted for, let's set the charge timer and get ourselves to the other world line before some Madraya was cut off by a loud rumble and the clinking of boots outside the door. Spinning on his heel and drawing his sidearm, he just managed to get it rained on the door when five Thurian troopers came through the sealed bulkhead. Pulling the, trigger twice. He dropped two and threw his kabar through another trooper's throat. Rose had spun out of her chair, dropping the other two. Son of A status. Midraya yells out, checking on what remained of his squad. All good sir. Weapon Sergeant Carolyn Meyer called back. Nearly took a few hits but managed to get the civvies out of the way in time. Good. All of you get ready. We're moving, to the gate away and getting out of here in just a moment. Midraya turned back to Rose, prepared to set the timer when he saw this sparking console filled with holes. Well fuck. Rose finished his sentence for him when she saw what he was looking at. Fuck fuck fuck. Can not a god's damn thing go right for us today? Kicking the sparking console only causes it to be an outdented sparking, console filled with holes. Maybe it's our luck finally catching up to us. Meyer snorted at Stewart's comment before seeing Rose's icy stare. While it was a long-running joke that the black cat's own luck would catch up with them, there was a time and place and this was neither. Midraya took a deep breath, closing his eyes as he came to terms with what he was about to do. I've got it. Rose take, everyone left and get through the gateway with them. I'll make sure those bastards don't get to follow you. Rose snaps around to stare at Midraya eyes wide with shock and a bit of horror. My ass you will. You'll never make it out in time. There has to be another way Izuku. Izuku gave her a small, sad smile, already tapping away on another terminal that was still functional. We both know I, have no choice. A remote bypass is impossible from on this world line, much less the other because of our own countermeasures. None of us have time to bypass them before the Flurians take full control of this facility. No, I won't be coming with you. Rose opened her mouth as if to argue with Midraya before closing her mouth and clenching her jaw. Please Rose. I need to do this. It was my, project. It was my work. My responsibility. Would have liked to see what's the other side myself though. Oh well. I'm sure you'll do fine without me. Rose was about to retort, only to be distracted by another not-so-distant rumble. Fine. Everyone heard the man. Get down the stairs and get through the gateway. Rose picked up her rifle from where it was leaning against the now-defunct console, then headed towards the staircase off the right side of the command center. She stopped just before the stairs and looked back to Madraya. I'm sorry. Rose's voice cracked in sorrow. Sorrow for losing another black cat. Another member of her family. For losing his Yuku. For the first time since the day started, he gave Rose her a full, radiant smile that could have blinded someone in another time, and place. Had to be me. Someone else might have gotten it wrong. Midraya continued to tap away at the console, watching through the glass as his close friends and family stepped through the gateway. Rose turned and gave him one last look of regret and self-loathing before stepping through the gateway. 
It was only a few minutes later when he had finished priming the reactors that he heard the heavy bootsteps behind him. He picked up the detonator and turned with a smile on his face. Through the door stepped General Norwood himself. Six and a half feet of muscle and scar tissue with salt and pepper hair. His generally clean shaven face had a fine layer of stubble on it and his eyes had heavy bags under them as if he hadn't gotten any rest during the last day either. The man may have been in his mid fifties, but he was absolutely not a man to be trifled with. And what pray tell have I done to warrant a visit from his most magnificent of the high command himself? Midraya still smiled as the general's eyes locked with his in recognition, his face contorting in disgust and loathing. The rat has been chased into its hole and yet, cornered, it still dares ask, its superior what it has done wrong. The general rumbles his response, multiple Thurian troopers coming in behind him and fanning out, each pointing their rifles at Midraya's chest. But to answer your question. You needn't worry as your little rebellion ends here. Midraya's smile settled into a feral grin. Oh, on that general, we do agree. Norwood, finally noticing the switch in Midraya's hand, cries out. His cries are simply lost as Midraya closes his eyes and the world flashes to white, beep, beep. Midraya's eyes snap open at the sound. The smell of antiseptics is harsh in the air and his body feels weak as if he hasn't moved in a long time, what's going on here? The last thing I remember is pulling the trigger on the detonator. That was an explosion with the force of all three of the fusion reactors in the power center, not to mention the charges all over the facility. Nothing should have escaped that blast. In fact, there shouldn't be anything left of the mountain range but ashes. Where am I? How am I alive? Am I alive? Madraya, looked around, taking in his surroundings for the first time since he had awoken so suddenly. He was in some kind of hospital gown, that much was obvious, and the view outside of the window looked like Japan, but that was impossible. He couldn't be back. Could he? When he looked to his left, he expected to find the four in his arm leading to some kind of solution and machines. Instead, he encountered a very surprised nurse whose mouth was open in shock. Um, hello? Midraya asked. The nurse snapped out of it and spoke in Japanese. You're awake. Well yes, that would be expected if I'm speaking with you. The nurse snaps her mouth closed as she realizes that he was indeed awake and talking to her. I need to get the doctors right now. With that, the nurse ran out of the room, leaving the door open in her rush. Midraya chuckled at her panic. He would still be here when she got back. Leaning back he started contemplating what had happened. If I really am back in Japan, I wonder if anything has changed. The doctors came fast after the nurse left the room. Asking him a million questions to verify that he was still all there. Drawing blood, asking questions, drawing more, blood, asking more questions. This went on for some time before he realized they were calling him by his name. To them, he is Madraya is Yuku. No one but the black cats knew that name. He hadn't gone by that name in years. He really was back in Japan, wasn't he? It wasn't until his mother busted into his hospital room, tears already pouring down her cheeks, that it sank in that this was real. That, he is back in Japan. That he is fourteen again. When his mother wrapped him in her embrace for the first time in 18 years, that some part of his yuku that he had buried away snapped. In his mother's arms, he broke and sobbed with her for the first time in far too long, six and a half days was all it took after his yuku woke up to remember. He hated hospitals, and he wasn't too overly fond of doctors either. Oh, don't get him wrong, they weren't performing experiments on their patients or really anything evil for that matter. They never did anything at all that would make him think that the medical staff of Mujudafu General was plotting something nefarious against him. In fact, it was the exact opposite, and it was driving his yuku insane. He had barely been awake a week, and of that week, barely any of it was spent alone. Either a nurse was checking on him and his vitals, another wheeling him to a test chamber, or a doctor performing some test or another on him. 
the constant coddling as if he were an invalid reminded him entirely too much of what society expected of the quirkless. Much less a quirkless that had, apparently, just come out of a year-long coma. The only silver lining to any of the constant tests or the incessant physical therapy were the visits from his mother in the afternoon. Oh, sure. He was certain she would stay every waking moment were he only to ask. But he couldn't do that to her. She had responsibilities to attend to, a job, to perform as one of the top chefs in the Shizuoka prefecture. She was quite good at what she did. And it meant a lot to her. If there was one thing Izuku wasn't going to risk, it was her losing her position. Thus Izuku persevered through the ceaseless presence of the medical staff and complied with their requests as best as he could, considering his body had apparently weakened considerably in, his year of beauty sleep. Not that it was to be unexpected considering just how weak he was to start with. Ear me, Mr. Madraya? Izuku snapped his head back to the doctor that was talking. He had been lost in thought wondering what else the doctors could possibly test him for. I'm sorry, Dr. Kenichi. What was that? I was thinking about. Something. Besides that, I've barely gotten a few hours sleep across these last few days with all the testing. Dr. Kenichi Tota was, by anyone's standards for a doctor, young. In his early thirties, he was barely out of medical school. But despite this, this prime man that, were he not sitting, would tower over most of his patients had cemented himself as an asset at the general hospital. Currently, the young doctor sat beside his Yuku's bed, rattling off the day's results to the testing he had undergone. Giving Madraya a rueful smile, he let on that the pause had told him exactly what it was as Yuku had been contemplating. Oh yes. I'm quite sure you were. As I was saying, young man, you've made absolutely remarkable progress in terms of your recovery. Your MMSE score is practically perfect, which is shocking considering the degree of your head trauma when you came in here initially. Besides that, your mass scores have improved so rapidly I would suspect that you had a quirk that was speeding up your recovery. Of course. That would be if I hadn't personally run your blood twice more to check for an active quirk factor. Which, if it isn't clear from my phrasing, was absent. What can I say doc, is Yuku gave him a small humorous, smile, I heal quickly. That, young man, is a serious understatement? The rate at which you have recovered is nothing short of a medical marvel. Regardless. You are for all intents and purposes recovered enough for me to clear you to be discharged. Though you should still continue the exercises we have had you do. We'll also be sending a packet home with you containing any information that you might need. Of course, if you have questions, you can still call the hospital directly. I'll get the paperwork together, and when your mother gets here this afternoon, you'll be able to head home with her. Thank you, sir. Is you could dip his head thanking the doctor for finally clearing his release. You can thank me by not ending up back in here again. We're still not sure how you managed to get those injuries of yours. Are you sure you don't remember anything? No sir. Though I'll be sure to inform the detective if I do happen to remember something. The doctor nodded his head before turning and exiting the room. Sighing, as Yuku sank back into the mattress. He knew perfectly well who had put him in the hospital in the first place. Sure, he couldn't blame Katsuki for the villain that, stumbled drunk into the alley after he had left. He certainly couldn't blame Katsuki for the villain having had a bad day. For the villain loving an easy target to take his frustrations out on. But he most certainly could blame him for the years of torment that he had been subjected to. He could hold him accountable for putting starburst scarring across his body and he most certainly could blame him for his general quirkist nonsense. If he learned anything in the last years, it's that you don't need a quirk to make something of yourself. The trip home was refreshing for his Yuku. He was glad to be out of the hospital. The medical personnel had been nothing but kind to him, but he was really enjoying being back in real clothing. The city was familiar, yet so strange at the same time. Too, is Yuku. It was as if he had stepped back in time. To a home that he had never expected to see again. It was so peaceful here. 
such a contrast to the silent ruins he had been stalking through only weeks before. There was life here, people living their lives happily without any thought to what could happen to them at the drop of a coin. Is Yuku, are you okay? For the second time that day, Is Yuku was, snapped out of his thoughts by a concerned voice. We're home, honey. Midrayanko was a short woman with a mature air about her, and she was as kind as they came. Izuku simply hugged his fretting mother and breathed deeply. Don't worry mom. I feel better now than I have in a long time. Izuku stepped into his old home with a smile on his face. He hadn't expected to ever be back here, but he, was certainly going to make the most of it now that he was. I'm going to start work on dinner. It's your favorite katsudan. Why don't you go and get settled back in while I'm making the food? Nodding his head, Izuku walked slowly down the hallway, just taking in the details as he did. So many things familiar, yet only in distant passing. As if the things he was trying to remember were fading out, of memory. Only to then be forced back to the surface. The pencil markings on the wall where his mother had marked his height as he grew the little scratches in the paint from where he had been playing hero a little too rough when he was younger. He let his hand trail across the wood architrave around the doors, breathing deeply and taking in the mixture of scents he could only associate in his, mind with his childhood. Then suddenly in front of him was the door to a room he hadn't seen in so long. The old all might sign with his name written in stunted crayon handwriting still hanging, slanted, from its peg on his door. Izuku gripped the doorknob and opened the door to what seemed like another time. All Might merchandise was hanging from practically every surface and figurines were on, every shelf. His journals on his bookshelf one of the blessed few things in the room that wasn't somehow related to the man. Izuku sweat dropped looking into the room in what was a state of almost shock. I knew that I was particularly a fan of All Might, but I have to admit, I didn't realize it was quite this fanatical of an obsession. Though I suppose being the number one hero, in what might as, well be the world does get you a few crazy obsessed fans. Placing his papers from the hospital onto his desk, he took a moment to just sit down and look at his room. He would have to do something about the room. Maybe take down a few of the older posters and box up some of the dozens of figurines. But for now, at least, he was content to just look. To sit and remember the past and let his memories of growing up keep him company for the moment. Izuku was fairly certain he had an eye as to why he was able to get out of months of rehabilitative therapy within the week, but he wasn't quite sure quite how it was possible if he were correct. Don't let your fear hold you back. Use your fear, understand it. Don't let it rule you, but make it work for you so you can do what needs to be done, Rose's words echoed in the back of his head as he sat at his desk. The sad ghost of a smile twitched at his Yuku's lips. An entirely different world and your words can still reach me. You'd be proud of yourself for that, Rose. His Yuku stood, walking over to the mirror positioned next to his dresser. The augmentations we developed for the black cats would explain my recovery time, but how would they, have come back here with me? If they did, clearly not all of them did. The doctors certainly would have noticed subdermal implants in their follow-up tests, right? That generally rules those out, but what about the genetic ones? The genes we altered for muscle growth, density, and regeneration would certainly explain the recovery, but I can't exactly test those in quick fashion. The mental genes, we altered for reaction time certainly still seem to be in play if the hospital tests were of any indication. What about the activatable traits we altered? That's something to try. I didn't have time to alter myself with many of them boo a burst of happy, bubbling laughter brought as you out of his thoughts. At his doorway stood his mother looking at him as if her world were complete for the first, time in a long time. Look at you. I was all worried because you were so quiet on the way back from the hospital, but look at you now. Home, not even night, and already muttering so quickly that I can't understand what you're saying. Come on hun, dinner's on the table and there is no reason to let it get cold. All right, thanks mom. I'll be out in just a second. Inko smiled and walked back, towards the kitchen, 
Izuku looked back at the mirror and leaned into his reflection. Taking a deep breath and remembering Rose's words, he focused and opened his eyes. Where one would normally find deep, dark emerald eyes, instead one would, at that moment, find eyes a bright viridian, cyan specks floating in what seems to be another worldly sea of color and light. Well looky there, Izuku murmured under his breath, looks like I still have a piece of you all after all. Letting his focus drop away and his eyes to return to their normal shade, he smiled at the thought. Then frowned. How is this possible? Izuku walked towards the dining room shaking his head. At the moment it doesn't matter. All that matters is that he still has some of his augments, and that would be incredibly useful. Sitting down at the table, he smiled at his mother and thanked her for the food. Taking a bite, he froze. It had been so long since he'd had his mother's cooking that he had forgotten just how amazing it was. At that moment, that katsudon was the best thing he had tasted in 18 long years. It wasn't until he heard his mother's concerned question that he realized he was crying. I I'm fine, Izuku choked out, around the sob already building in the back of his throat. I'm just really happy to be home. Inka teared up as well at the sand, laughing. The two ate dinner together in an odd state of happy crying revelry. She caught him up on the major things that had happened in the last year and he gladly listened. When she heard from him that he was planning on heading back to classes already, she was, initially concerned. But after some reassurances that he would be fine playing a little bit of catch-up, she relented. He knew there would be no catch-up at all if he could remember even half of what he had learned working alongside the rescued scientists at the Elysian installation. If he could, then he would be ahead of most college graduates, much less some middle school math class. After dinner, he excused himself to shower and get ready for bed. After doing so he laid awake, unused to the relative silence of his room. There had always been something happening or some noise being made in the barracks. Be it the air pumps working away to keep the underground facility breathing or a game of poker in the common area, there was some noise to assure you everything was fine. The silence was, dangerous, he had learned. The calm before the oncoming storm. Sighing, he rolled over and did his best to get to sleep. Surely going back to school couldn't be any worse than anything else he had experienced, his Yuku's eyes snapped open. His hand shooting out to grasp her round on his sideboard for his sidearm. His breathing harsh and erratic, sweat rolling down his back as he tries to calm himself. Trying desperately to focus on where he was. In Japan, he panted. I'm back in Japan. No one is hurt. No one is dying. No one is dead again. Slowly as Yuko got his breathing under control, his heart rate back to an acceptable level. Nausea rolling in his stomach fading away. Releasing his shirt where it was bunched under his clenched right hand, Izuku brought both his hands to his face, rubbing from the root of his nose to his eyes. Sighing, Izuku looked over to his clock, noting the time. Well, technically I shouldn't be getting up for my first day back for another two hours. There is no point in wasting the time though. No way I'm getting back to sleep after that. Turning to his wardrobe, he picked out a pair of shorts that still fit and kept his tank top on him. It's already soaked through with sweat. Might as well use it for my morning routine. Slipping from his room and into the living area, Izuku took a moment to begin stretching and to take in the details around the apartment that he had, failed to notice the day before in his nostalgia. While he had only been gone from this home, this world, for a year here, there were still differences. The photos of his father were notably absent. Not that it bothered him much he hadn't known the man very well. Leaving as early in his Yuku's life as Hayazashi tended to stunt the growth of memories. Last he had heard, his father had been working, somewhere outside of Japan. Rolling his shoulder, Izuku slipped out the front door and started with a light jog down the road. When he was about halfway to his destination, he picked up his pace into a dead sprint. It wasn't long before he reached the old beach. Izuku breathed deeply, placing his hands on the back of his head. I am nowhere near where I want to be, clearly. I used to be able to, sprint several miles without issue. 
Now I can barely run a mile and a half without feeling like my body is giving up on me. Looking up from where Izuku leaned against the beach walkway railing, Izuku stared out in disbelief at the now mountainous piles of trash that covered Digaba Beach. The last time he had been here was only a year and some change before. How the hell did it get like this? The trash problem was bad before, but did no one bother to fix it? It's the city's property, so, alright, it might not be the biggest priority. But good gods, I can't even see the horizon, and the beach is a good 8 to 10 feet down at the very least from the walkway. The trash is piled at least 20 or so feet above even that. How the hell did the beach get covered in trash at least 30 feet, deep and no one, especially a hero, took note of this. Izuku leaned back from the railing and looked further down the beach, shaking his head. While absolutely insane and would have to have something done about it, that was an issue for another time and place. He'd deal with it himself, he resolved, but not now. From what Izuku could see, the sun was beginning to crest the horizon. Not that he would see it as he wanted because of a mountain of refuse. If this is any indication of how this day is going to go, then it is going to be a long day. I just jinxed it, didn't I? Sighing, Izuku started heading back to his apartment building once again at a dead sprint, hoping that he hadn't. Stepping back into his home, the first thing that Izuku heard was soft crying. Stepping quickly in, muscles tensing and adrenaline pumping. Ready to fight at any moment, Izuku came face to face with one crying Madraya Inko sitting on the couch. Mom? Izuku stepped quickly to his mother, surveying the room for any sign of a threat. Mom, what's wrong? He set his hand on her shoulder gently, her eyes snapping up to meet his. Izuku? Oh, thank God. I thought it was all just a dream. I thought. It was all a dream and you were back in that hospital bed and you rent back here Adam Ian she cut off as her words became too quick and her sobbing started back up again. Izuku paled, realizing what had happened and cursing himself for not saying something, for not even leaving a note that he was stepping out. SHH. SHHH, it's alright, it's fine. I'm right here, mom. I won't be going anywhere again. I'm sorry I didn't think before I stepped out for a run. I'm sorry. SHHH. Izuku's breath hitched slightly as he tried to calm his mother. There had never been a threat other than the looming threat that was implications. The implications of him disappearing. Of not being there for his mother. Of what she had thought when she had awoken to find his bed empty and his room devoid of life. It took. Some time before either Midraya had calmed down enough that Izuku was able to step away from his mother and shower off his exercise. Once he had done so, brushed his teeth and pulled his hair back into a small ponytail as it had gotten rather long in his year-long hospital visit. Izuku put on his uniform slacks and shirt. Tucking his dress shirt in and slipping his jacket on, Izuku stepped out, and walked into the dining room where his mother waited with breakfast. Her eyes were still rimmed in red from where she had been crying, but she was smiling again. He needed to keep her that way. She deserved that from him. They ate their breakfast in relative silence before stepping out the door, wishing each other a good day and parting to head to their respective destinations. Izuku had been, wrong. Oh so wrong. He had grown too used to schools without quirks. Schools that were regimented with the authority of a military command that had the respect of their men. Aldred Junior High made a military academy, where each individual was armed, seemed like a friendly, welcoming place to vacation. If the Osmian Academy judged your worth on your actions, then Aldred judged your worth on how, likely your quirk was to make you a hero. If you had a flashy, strong quirk, such as one resident pyromaniac sociopath, then you were the top of the totem pole. If you had a quirk that the faculty didn't judge highly, such as your hair changing colors at will, then you weren't exactly the VIP of the class, but at least you were treated as a human being. If only a lesser one. Finally, if you were, quirkless or had what society might perceive as villainous for your quirk. Well, some things make even hell seem friendly. The moment as Yuku stepped through the doors of the junior high, he could tell he wasn't welcome here. 
students would look at him and quickly look away, blocking out his mere existence as if it were a blot on their nice, comfortable lives. Others would stare at him with, unhidden disgust, whispering to their fellow student about him. Others still would look and try their best to not catch his attention. The few souls that might have given him the time of day, the few who might have been friendly, were they of course not worried about the consequences of being associated with him. Izuku stepped into his classroom just before the bell rang and caught the attention, of the school's chief bully and general pain in his ass, Bakugo Katsuki. The look in his eyes as he looked at Mandraya, and the feral grin that sprouted to his lips, was enough to tell Izuku that he would be as much of a problem as he used to be. Well, there went the hope that perhaps the coma had made him have an epiphany regarding his behavior. Before he could step further into the classroom, his teacher caught his attention. Ahem. Mr. Madraya. I do have to apologize. The teacher smirked at him and let just the slightest bit of condescension slip into his tone. You have to understand that we didn't expect to see you back here so soon considering your... Ahem. Circumstances. As such, we gave your desk to another student that had transferred in. As it is, you'll have to sit in the back, on the floor. I'm sure you'll be able to handle that until we can get you properly sorted. Izuku nodded his head and started to make his way to the back of the class. Good to see the teachers are as terrible as ever as well. The more things change. Izuku let his thoughts trail off before taking a seat leaning against some shelves at the back of the class with a clear line of sight down the aisle, to the board. Initially, he pulled the notebook he had brought with him out of his bag to take notes. Very quickly, however, Izuku realized that it was completely pointless to take notes, as he could do this kind of work while being asleep. In fact, he had actually completed, correctly he might add far more complex problems than what were being given to the students while being practically asleep. The students kept glancing back at Izuku. A variety of emotions were evident on their faces. Confusion as to his lack of notes taking, disbelief that he had come back after what he had been through, more disgust. That one wasn't terribly strange, as it was always there, but it was still annoying how little he had done to deserve the treatment that he was receiving. He leaned his head back, and closed his eyes, sighing. A long day indeed. Midraya, if you aren't even going to attempt to pay attention to the work then there is no point to you even being here. I realize you likely need to catch up, but at least pay attention. Without even opening his eyes, Midraya responded because F is odd, FX FX. For X0. X0 and Fx3 sin x plus 4 cos x3 sin x plus 4 cos x by definition. Hence, 4, x0, Fx, 3 sin x plus 4 cos x, 3 sin x 4 cos x. Is that sufficient as an answer for you? Izuku opened his eyes and looked his teacher dead in the eyes. That being said, you're going to struggle yourself with getting the right answer, as you graphed the original equation incorrectly. Sputtering. The teacher looked from Izuku to the board, to the problem, and back again. That is correct, thank you for your answer, Midraya. Leaning his head back once more, Izuku listened to the whispers this exchange had created. All he could do was shake his head and continue to listen to the lesson that held no real value for him. That teacher didn't call on him again for the rest of the period. The bell for lunch finally rang. Granting Izuku at least a momentary reprieve from the mind numbing lessons. Stepping into the restroom, Midraya leaned down, dipping his hands in the sink and splashing his face. Leaning there against the sink, he rubbed his eyes. Well, well. Look here, the useless nerd makes his return. What, didn't learn your place a year ago? Bakuka rumbled from behind him, hands crackling like an impending thunderstorm. Oh, good. Now I have to deal with this, jackass. How did I manage this before? Deal with everyone acting as if others were less than human? I just got done fighting against one group that thought this way. And is that pride I hear in his voice? Is he proud that he was in some way responsible for a year-long coma? That thought horrified Izuku more than any other. Did he truly think that this behavior was suitable for someone who wanted to be a hero? 
taking a deep breath and trying to relax his natural instinct to the sound of explosions now, as Yuku opened his eyes. Oi, Deku. Don't you ignore me. Bakugo roared and was reaching for him when Deku opened his eyes and stared him in the eye from the mirror. The look in those eyes froze Bakugo for a moment. He took a step back, and it was as if the very temperature in the air had dropped. Deku turned to him and said in a voice too calm, too cold, to be the Deku he knew, Well, Bakugo, it does seem that some things never change. You have made it abundantly clear. We are not friends, and we haven't been in a very long time. So let me give you one warning and one warning only. I am not in the mood for this. Deku went to step past Gatsuki. That single step was all it took to make something snap inside of him. How dare you look down on me you quirkless piece of shit. Bakugo swung his fist at Deku. Hand crackling with small explosions. The sweet caramel smell of nitroglycerin flooding the air of the relatively small restroom. He was going to show this worthless piece of shit where he belonged. He wouldn't get away with speaking to him like that. If a year didn't show him where he belonged, he would have to make it another. Izuku took a step forward as if to leave the restroom when Bakugo screeched and swung at him. His lips pressed into a thin line as he raised his left arm, pushing Bakugo's right hook off course before grabbing his wrist in his right. Grabbing his shoulder at his rotator muscle with his left hand, he used Gatsuki's own momentum to wrench his arm behind his shoulder blade and push him forward and over. His shoulder made a horrific pop at the same time his face slammed down onto the bathroom counter, breaking his nose. By this point, his mouth had twisted into a snarl. Is this what you wanted Katsuki? Did you want to prove yourself better than the cripple in your head? What sick, twisted logic did you have to use to get yourself to, this point? That someone worthless in your mind somehow has so much power over you. Izuku growled it at Bakugo before letting him go with a shove. Sighing, Izuku shook his head and turned to leave the restroom, this time unimpeded. Just before exiting, he stopped at the door. Looking over his shoulder at Gatsuki still bleeding on the floor, he stared into Bakugo with eyes entirely too old, too, experienced, and too sad to be the eyes of a 14-year-old. Izuku whispered one last thing before leaving Katsuki bleeding on the floor. Well, Kakan, you succeeded in one thing. The Madraya Izuku you knew died in that alleyway. I certainly won't be following you any longer. Madraya sat with his bento on his lap and his back to the fence lining the roof. He had never felt welcome in the cafeteria. Too many hostile eyes staring at him from all angles. But up here. There was something peaceful about it. It was quiet, and the wind slowly ruffled his hair, providing him a companionship that he hadn't had for a long time at this school. Just as he finished his mother's cooking that she had prepared for him, and never again would he ever take it for granted, the intercom crackled, requesting his presence in the principal's office. Of course it was. Well, if this was how it was going to go down, then let's dance. There were a lot of things that Madraya expected when he walked into the principal's office. What he hadn't expected to see was Mitsuki and Masaru Bakugo sitting with their son, who, to some small bit of satisfaction for his yuku, was sitting there with his arm in, a sling, paper towels stuffed up his nose, and a nice dark bruise blooming to life on his cheekbone. Katsuki and Mitsuki were giving him an absolutely venomous look while poor Masaru simply looked confused by the whole situation. His own mother was sitting pale-faced across from them, staring at what his Yuku had done to Katsuki. Good, now that Mr. Madraya is here, we can talk about how we are, going to proceed with his expulsion. The principal was the first to speak after his Yuku had walked into the room. He was a short, fat man, by either genetics or his own personal inaction. Izuku wasn't sure which it was, but in the end it didn't particularly matter. When he spoke of expulsion, Godsuki gained a smug smirk on his face, which his own mother mirrored. It was only Inko that started, sputtering, assuring the principal that there had to be some misunderstanding and that Izuku wouldn't do something like this. Before the principal could respond, Mitsuki cut in. 
Are you calling my son a liar, Inko? Because he certainly didn't do this to himself. The principal cut back in with a smirk. Yes, indeed. Which is why I will be expelling Mr. Madrai effective immediately. We, obviously can't keep someone clearly so violent in this school where he could hurt someone again. Besides that, we also couldn't do something that would make our star pupil so uncomfortable. After all, what would H think if his attacker was still walking the halls? Before any one of them could speak another word, before Inko could defend her son, even before Mitsuki could agree, Izuku spoke. And, when he spoke, each person in the room stilled. Katsuki's eyes blew wide when he heard the tone. It was a tone that he had never heard from Deku's mouth before and a tone he never wanted to hear again. In an absolutely sickly sweet tone laced with the most concentrated acid, Izuku spoke confidently only a few words. Oh no, Mr. Principal, I don't think you'll be taking the course of action at all. The principal swallowed before responding. Izuku's presence filled the room, demanding their attention. And why would that be young man? Izuku smiled, and when he did, the principal was sure in that moment that the smile would haunt his dreams. Well sir, you see. Izuku shrugged out of his uniform jacket. I do wonder what would happen to the school if you were to choose that course of action. After all, which do you think will catch more media time? The headline, Quirkless Student Beats Up Star Pupil, or After Years of Abuse, Quirkless Boy Finally Snaps fights back against tormentor the principal stopped seeing this young boy as a boy at all are you trying to blackmail us son the media would never believe you and even if they did they wouldn't give a quirkless nothing like you the time of day the principal sat forward staring as yuku in the eyes but froze when his smile widened further becoming very cold the hint of acid that had been there before suddenly became readily apparent finally showing your true colors, are you? But blackmail? No no, you misunderstand. I'm not blackmailing you at all. I'm simply informing you of what will happen if you, choose to go through with expelling me. Not that I plan on sticking around anyway, as I will be withdrawing from your oh so fine institution following this conversation regardless of the decision you make. Izuku very carefully began unbuttoning his dress shirt starting with his wrist cuffs. You see, sir. The media may not give a quirkless nobody the time of day, you are correct. But given, evidence and a police investigation into not only a school but their star pupil, I am quite sure that it would then be a story well worth airing all over the country and I do wonder what would become of a school so thoroughly disgraced. What do you mean police investigation, young man? The principal looked mildly shaken at the statement. The media was one thing. They could fend off the media, well enough, but if the police were involved, public record wasn't quite as easy to deal with. Oh, that's quite simple really? Izuku allowed his dress shirt to drop away, the smile still blazing away on his face. Initially, everyone in the room had watched the shirt as it dropped to the ground. But then their eyes were drawn back up to Izuku's arms, chest, and back. There across what should have been fairly immaculate 14 year old skin lay a network of starburst scar tissue his right shoulder was almost completely scarred but what was very obvious was the handprint that had been seared like a brand into his shoulder i do think the police will want to find out about this don't you think besides that you seem to be under the impression that when the police come here to investigate that they won't find the blood spattered across the hallways the claw marks on the inside of dark closet doors from students trying to escape. That they won't find all of the misery and abuse that you, my dear principal, have allowed to fester here. Izuku's voice had dropped in pitch into practically a growl. Let me assure you, principal, just in case you thought you had hidden and cleaned it up, bleach won't stop them from finding the blood. By this point, the blood had entirely drained from Mitsuki's face. She barely managed to choke out her words as Izuku calmly picked his shirt up and began pulling it back on. What have you done, Katsuki? What the hell have you done? Her voice was barely a horrified whisper. It doesn't matter, 
You old hag. He deserved it. Who cares anyway? He's a, useless, quirkless piece of sh Bakugo never got to finish that sentence before his father roared his name at him. His father never spoke up. Never got angry. But the look on his face now was a mixture of horror and unbridled fury. I see at least your parents understand the ramifications of your actions. Izuku had finished buttoning his dress shirt and simply gave the principal one last cold, smile. So. Are you going to accept my withdrawal, or are you going to expel me? The principal said nothing as he looked to Inko, who had been silent through most of this. Well, Mrs. Madriya, it would be up to you whether or not to sign off on the withdrawal forms. Inko wasted no time looking the principal in the eyes. Quietly, Inko stood up and stepped forward the few steps to the principal's desk. If you think for even a second after hearing all of that, that my Izuku will ever be anywhere near this school again, then you are a very stupid man. The comrade in Inko's voice didn't scare him nearly as well as the show Izuku had just put on. But the message was received loud and clear all the same. Mitsuki, however, was very, very certain that she was scared of Inko right now. She had, only seen her this angry once, and she doubted that man ever regained use of his lower extremities. Before Izuku left the room with his mother, he stopped. Turning once again, he addressed the Bakugo family. I am sorry that it came to this, Andy. I didn't want it to end on such a sour note. You and Uncle Masaru were always so kind to me. Izuku gave them a sad smile before his face hardened and, he turned to the door. And Katsuki. Bakugo grudgingly looked over to where Izuku stood in the doorway. Take a hard look at yourself after this. Because right now? You're nothing more than a villain. With that parting comment, Izuku stepped out the door, not to be seen by Bakugo again for several years. The trip home from Alro was tense. Perhaps that was putting it lightly. Inko's face was a mixture of emotions. Horror, sorrow, consternation, self-loathing, and righteous fury were each taking their turns and sometimes even mixing. By the time they had stepped through the door, Izuku was fairly certain that if he'd had his knife on him then he could have cut the tension and served it on a plate. Izuku's eyes tracked his mother as she walked into their home walked across to their couch, and to Izuku's shock, immediately broke down into a crying mess. Of all of their reactions, he hadn't expected this to be one of them. Anger at effectively being kicked out of his school, or at him ruining an age-old friendship with the Bakugo family. He had not expected what was effectively a full, breakdown. It was some time before Izuku had managed to calm his mother enough they could talk. Despite this, her voice still cracked when she asked him to explain. Where would you like me to start? Izuku responded slowly, not quite sure how much he should tell her. From what he had gathered during her sobbing, she blamed herself for Izuku's suffering. From the start Izuku. How long has this, been going on? I thought Godsuki was your friend? Why did you never say anything? I knew there was bullying, but you wouldn't talk to me and I just stood by. Oh God, I just stood by when I should have stepped in and demanded answers. I should have stopped this from getting this far. Inko was slowly slipping back into her spiral, and Izuku spoke up before she could go any farther with her train of thought. Still, he sighed, if he wanted to reach his end goal here, she would have to know a lot of what he had hidden. He only hoped she could forgive herself, as he had never once blamed her. Well. When you ask when it started and how long it's been going on, it's hard to answer exactly. When I was diagnosed quirkless is when things started to change for me. You know how society views the quirkless. Even if the government makes all sorts of rules and laws otherwise, well, actions speak louder than words, and the way we're treated? It says a lot more than their words. As for Katsuki. Well, that would have been around the time he got his quirk as well. I suppose, though, I didn't see that clearly until much later. He became arrogant, prideful. He was the best, and only he could be, the best. Anyone that didn't fall in line with him were targets. Anyone he viewed as lesser than him were targets, regardless. 
hence his particular violence when it came to me. My quirklessness makes me a prime target to make him feel better about himself. For some sick, twisted reason or another. I didn't talk to you because, well, because I didn't see anything wrong with it myself for a long, time. I just thought it was the natural order of things. After all, that's what has been instilled into us for so long. You shouldn't blame yourself. I never have. You couldn't have helped, and to be honest, some of this, such as the discrimination, will likely continue wherever I go. Is Yuku sighed, sorrow leeching into his voice as he went on, as he recited a dark part of his history with a new, point of view. He leaned back, eyes losing their focus. Looking no longer at his mother but past her to a place no one should ever go. I've had. Well, I've had a lot of time to think in this last. Year. The conclusion I came to was that I was done dealing with being treated like I was a second class human simply because of the lack of a tool. Because that's what quirks are. A unique tool to each, person. Izuku shook his head and snorted hell, with the way things are, only a handful of people aren't a criminal if they use their quirks anyway. You would think that it wouldn't matter. Inko throws herself into him, crushing him in her embrace. He could feel the back of his shirt becoming soaked through with her tears, and she was sobbing once again. All Izuku could do was rub small circles, into her back doing his best to comfort his mother. Although he had long accepted that many of these things had been done to him, it was different for his mother. She was just now learning the true extent of the discrimination in this society. Discrimination in this society, huh? Well, that's a little too familiar. Izuku breathed deep and his mother pulled back, looking deep into his eyes. Her, on emerald, shimmering with tears. Promise me, Izuku that if something is truly bothering you, you'll tell me. Don't keep everything to yourself. I can't do this again. Don't worry, mom. Izuku shook his head. I don't plan on dealing with these things myself anymore. A man on his own can face other men. A man with a support network can face the entire world. Inko stepped back a little, confused as to where the words of wisdom had come from but perfectly satisfied in his answer. Her eyes lit again and she began pacing. Inko had been stewing on the issues, and now that the sorrowful talk had mostly passed and she'd gotten the promise she wanted out of him, she had clearly worked herself back to fury. At the very least I'm not letting you go back there, and I'll be damned if, Mitsuku's boy is coming anywhere near us from now on. I'm going to make Aldra wish they had never opened their doors at all. I'll have every one of their teaching licenses by the time I'm done. Well, certainly better than crying. But while I'm good with the prior. Mom. I'm not saying that we don't do something about it, but. Well, I have a plan for that. That school won't be around too much, longer. It has to be done carefully though. As much as I want to hate Katsuki, I can't ruin him yet. Oh don't get me wrong, I blame him for what he's done and I can hold him at fault. But. I mean. When was the last time you saw someone tell him no? Tell him what he was doing was wrong? Make him take a look at his actions? No, right now, he's what society has made him to be. As are all the other, students in that school that stood by. I can't end Katsuki's career before it can even get started. Not when it could so easily turn him into an actual villain. Not when I've long put it behind me. If he decides to continue down this path, then I have no problem ending him before he begins. Izuku's tone had leached into something dark. Something that his mother caught and gave him a worried look, the way he had behaved in the office came back to her. Something was different about her Izuku since he had woken up. He seemed. Older and more jaded. It worried her, but seeing as he had promised he'd tell her if something was bothering him, she'd let it go for now. Maybe he was just being honest with her for the first time. Besides all that, I think that the school problem may be self-solving. I, ah, uh, may be a little bit ahead of my classes. Inko stops her pacing long enough to narrow her eyes at his Yuku. We'll leave the discussion on what to do about the school and the Bikigos for another time. What do you mean ahead of your classes? Exactly how far ahead of them are you? 
is Yuko withers under his mother's stare. He may be mentally old enough to be an adult, but never will he be able to stand up to his mother's stare. Hey! Hey! Ah! I might be a few years? Decades ahead? I studied a lot? I could ace the content without looking at it and the teachers weren't fond of the idea of the quirkless student outdoing the others so they never let me move on? It wasn't a lie, as Yuku thought. He certainly could have answered, if not taught the subjects, better than most of the teachers, besides that, the augmentations had granted him a borderline photographic memory and spiked his IQ through the roof. So anything that he might not have learned, he would have picked up very quickly. I think it would probably be for the best if I found online classes that let me finish things at my own pace. It would be a better gauge of my abilities than school has been thus far, at least. Inko, rubbed at her eyes. It would lack social interaction and that was an issue. But if it let Izuku catch up to where he should be, then that issue could be dealt with later. Weary, she sighed, tired from the day's events, and sat back down. Looks like you got Hisashi's intelligence then. All right. All right, find a couple good options and we'll look over them together. Izuku could see the weary way she held herself now. She was reaching her limits for bullshit for the day, and quite frankly, he could relate to that on a spiritual level right now. But if this conversation was going to go how he figured it would, then he should just get it out of the way. Mom. Something happened with him while I was in the coma, didn't it? I can't help but notice things are different. Hisashi's photos are gone. Things that were left here that were his are gone now. What did he do? Izuku broached the topic carefully, unsure of what the answer was going to be. Well, when you were attacked, I contacted him on the island. Long story short, he stated I shouldn't worry about you. Izuku narrowed his eyes. Is that so? He suspected that his father had said far more than she was letting on, but he wasn't going to push her if she didn't want to talk. It would be easy enough to check into anyway. Yet another thing to add to his growing list of things to do. A couple weeks had passed since the events at Aldra and his Yuku sweat dropped as he stared at his computer screen. He had only started his online schooling a week prior and now he was staring at the completion screen for his sophomore year of high school, he had known he was ahead, but there had been several factors he hadn't anticipated. First, as it turned out, he remembered far more than he thought he had regarding his education. Sure, his language classes had taken him a moment to dust off the languages of this world. But after that learning, it was nothing compared to Osmian, Thurian or the slew of languages he had to learn in the academy for, cryptography. Secondly, he had evidently brought more than just a couple of the genetic splicings they'd endured. Only time would tell just how many had come with him, but right now they were reactivating as he worked his body back into shape. He'd only needed to sleep thrice in the last two weeks, and all three times had ended just as his first night had. Izuku shook his head, leaning back in his chair to, stare at his ceiling. He'd have to talk to someone eventually, he logically knew that. They had been trained with the knowledge of what they were doing to themselves. Even still, he couldn't help but feel that he shouldn't bother. He was living something like a second life, and he should feel blessed at the chance. But why him? Why not Sergeant Reed? Sergeant Wilson? Didn't they do as much, if not, more than him? He shook his head once more to clear his thoughts. Don't think like that. You know where that kind of thought process leads. You've seen it before. Don't go there. Izuku could feel himself getting twitchy. He had too much energy right now. It served him wonderfully when he was running field operations or working on a project, but this didn't challenge him in the slightest. Project, eh? His brain flashed back to Dagaba Beach. He could start cleaning the beach. But he knew that it wouldn't be enough. Not unless he wanted to be out on the beach cleaning in the wee hours of the morning. While an option, he wasn't quite that desperate yet. His mother wouldn't like the idea, and while the area was safe enough, he didn't particularly want to explain to the police why he had broken someone's spine for trying to mug him at three in the morning. 
I bet that beach has plenty of materials buried in there that are still usable, though. I'll be needing gear anyway if... Izuku stopped mid-thought, frowned, and sat up. Did he even still want to be a hero? He had certainly wanted to be one before the coma. But now? Could he call himself the hero with the things he had done, done to others? No, he knew he was no hero. He still wanted to help people, though, that hadn't changed. Police? No, too constrained by rules and red tape. Medical? He didn't want to help people only after the incident had already occurred. That would be a waste of his training. Vigilante? He wouldn't be doing anything illegal, technically. For once his quirkless status could actually help him, there, however, he would still be chased down on the technicalities of his gear and those laws. Military again? No. Not that there was an issue with the military. If anyone understood what they did it was him, but he wouldn't be satisfied with that in this world as it is now. In the end, heroics was his only choice. He'd take the license to be a hero, Izuku decided. If only so that he could help, people without the law getting in the way. But he certainly wouldn't ever consider himself one. Izuku wiped his brow of sweat as he cracked his neck and rolled his shoulders. Then his elbows, wrists, fingers, spine, knees, and ankles cracked as well. He winced when everything else cracked with his neck. Izuku had managed to convince the city to lend him a series of dumpsters that would be emptied each morning in exchange for his community service of cleaning the beach. It had taken entirely too many arguments to get even that, considering that the speech was supposed to be their responsibility in the first place. But he had them now, so that detail didn't particularly matter. He had only been at it for a couple days, but anyone could already see the difference. Whereas Yuku had once, been nothing more than a walking twig with a bush of hair on his head. Now he was sporting dense muscle up and down his body that clearly showed with his monochrome shorts and tank top. His hair pulled back into its ponytail where it was out of his way for the beach cleanup. Between the beach and his regimented exercise routine, he was rapidly regaining the muscle he'd had before waking up. Much, like the beach, though, progress towards his goals was slow. His yuku had been about right before in his estimates regarding the trash. 30 feet at its deepest points and at least 5 at a minimum at its thinnest. This resulted in mountains and dunes of refuse and abandoned parts. He was pretty sure there had been one or two cars he had already seen buried, and he'd only surveyed about 20% of the trash mountains thus far. While it had disgusted his Yuku initially as to just what some people considered trash, he found it helped him quite a lot. Everything from common scrap metal, of which was plentiful, to old platinum cased lighters. Any kind of precious metal like that always made his Yuku jump for joy. Those could be repurposed for all sorts of things later if he got access to some kind of forge. Platinum in specific was incredibly hard to come by and was wondrous when making electrodes. Not that he had delved too deeply into the mechanical side of things. That had always been left to their units to engineering sergeants with his Yuku handling the biological side of things. But right now, Izuku had all the time in the world and, for once, all the information he could want at his fingertips. So he would be damned if he wasn't going to take the opportunity to learn. He looked around at what he had accomplished in the last while. A path had been cut through the mountains of trash to about halfway into the beach where a large circular clearing sat. From the other side of the clearing, the path continued on until the water. Sadly, the first time the water was likely able to reach the sand unimpeded in years. One pile sat in the middle of the clearing. Particularly useful salvage or pieces that could be repurposed went into the pile. Otherwise, a very clear line of footprints from the beach to the dumpster detailed where Izuku had made countless treks to remove the useless, defunct, cannibalized, or illegitimate garbage. Well, Izuku muttered, progress is progress, I suppose. Time to load up and head home. Retrieving his empty bag from the side of the clearing, Izuku stepped over to the pile in the middle of the clean. Initially, when he had asked his mother to use their spare room as a workshop, he doubted she had been expecting him to start bringing in actual materials. 
not that he had started too much in the way of actual work quite yet. Right now, it, was mostly a dozen blueprints that he considered for the future and a few dozen more that he wanted to get replicated quickly so that he would have access to the materials he needed for more complex projects. There would be a lot of work to get the kinks worked out even if he had a mechanical background. As it was, he would be learning as he went. Which he didn't mind, but it would certainly cause, a certain loss of resources that he wasn't sure was feasible until he could secure a source of funds. Perhaps if Ikriya's Yuka was snapped out of his thoughts as he heard the crunch of sand under boots behind him. Spinning, he dropped both his bag and himself into a low stance ready for whatever might be behind him. Behind him stood a short girl that he expected was about his age, with pink hair, and a wild look in her eyes. She wore a black tank top that could have done with being a size larger as it showed her curves that were, frankly, incredibly well developed for their age. At her waist, a tool belt filled with a variety of gadgets hung over grey cargo pants and was completed by black combat boots. You. You're the one stealing my scrap. She barely had gotten the cry out before she, lunged forwards towards Izuku. Izuku was not ready for what was behind him, startled, Izuku took a step back from the charging girl. Why on earth was there someone charging him? And flailing a wrench around in the air to top it off. As startled as he was, Izuku had still drilled the response into his body and didn't need to think about it when he prepared to step forward and disarm the girl. Before he could, the girl's foot caught on a piece of stray metal and sent her, careening face first into the sand, sliding to a stop just in front of Izuku. Izuku waited a moment and when the girl twitched, lifting her head to glare at him, he coughed. Well. That was certainly something. Are you all right? Miss. Izuku addressed the girl now at his feet. The girl stood up in her skid mark, dusting herself off before striking a pose. I am the one and only Hatsume Mai, remember the name because I'll soon be the biggest name in hero support. And you. You are the one that is stealing all my project scrap. Hatsume swung her wrench at Izuku, missing when he sidestepped her. He began explaining to her while lazily dodging her rambunctious flailing, sand skittering across the beach with each movement. First of all, Ms. Hatsume, this beach is an illegal dumping, ground, and I am doing my best to clean it up. While I am using this as strength training, you are more than welcome to join me out here and take whatever you would like with you, as, once again, I am cleaning it up. Besides that, it is scrap, as you pointed out. It doesn't have an owner any longer, and you aren't the only one that needs parts. Hatsume froze mid-swing at that. Breathing deeply, eyes narrowing at his yuku, her crosser pupils dilating back and forth as she scanned over his body. She took him in carefully, toned muscle that was just shy of screaming jacked even if he was on the lithe side. Grit and grime in his nail bends with calluses forming on his hands and fingers. His skin was spattered with grime oil, and grease from cleaning. She took in the parts peeking out of, his Yuku's bag. Though she didn't generally admit it, he looked good. Not in the oh my god he's so attractive kind of way, not that she didn't think that rippling muscle and motor grease was attractive, but in the clearly he's working on something and he knows his stuff kind of way. She lowered her wrench to her side, placing it back into her tool belt. I may just do that. You said others needed. Scrap 2. I've come here for parts for a while and I've not seen anyone else. That leaves you the one needing parts as the other's part of that. Am I right? Another inventor? Hatsume had slid from aggressive to cool. If she was going to have a competitor scrapping from the same place then she would certainly need to keep an eye on them. Besides that, she couldn't let him get to all the good stuff, first. There had to be some treasures buried in those mountains. I suppose you can call me that. Izuku rubbed the back of his head, frowning. I'm working on some gear plans for getting into the hero course, but I'm running into roadblocks. Most of my knowledge lies in the biological sciences, not the mechanical. So some of the pieces I need to prepare for some of the gear is a struggle to create. 
He felt a chill run up his spine and focused his attention back onto Hatsum from where he had been thinking about his blueprint. Her gaze, at some point, went from the cold analytical stare that it had been, to some kind of hungry animal sizing him up for dinner. She grabbed him suddenly and started feeling him up and muttering to herself. Whoa there! Izuku backed out of her grasp, quickly, a noticeable heat rising to his cheeks. Just what exactly do you think you're doing? Hatsum smiled a wide, feral smile. You're going to be a hero, she said, as if it were the most obvious answer in the world. I'm going to be a hero support technician, and luckily for you, my specialty is in the realm of mechanics. She grabbed Izuku's arm again, dragging him along. Come, we have to, get to my workshop. I have so many babies I can show you. We have to make so many babies if we're going to get you into the hero course. Wait what? Izuku slammed his feet into the sand. I have no problem with going to your workshop and talking gear, but what the hell is this about babies? Hatsum released him and pulled what looked suspiciously like a collapsible baton from her tool belt, flicking her wrist, she extended it, and after pressing the button on the base of it, it turned out Izuku was right. It was a baton. This baton, however, was clearly electrified. The entire body of the baton crackled with lightning as Hatsum cackled. This is one of my best babies so far. Most stun batons cap out somewhere around 9 million volts, but I've managed to not only double the volts, and then some, it comes in at just around 20 million volts while keeping the amperage down below the 0.2 lethal threshold but I've also managed to electrify the entire rod rather than just the tip. Hatsum babbled about her electrified rod while Izuku's wet dropped from the crackling power far too close for comfort. You call your inventions your babies. It wasn't so much a question, as Izuku, had gotten that much, but more of a statement of disbelief that he had managed to run into someone that was both insane enough and smart enough to help him with what he needed to do. Obviously. Now let's get going. Before Hatsum could grab him again, Izuku dipped back out of the way. Let me grab my stuff and we'll stop by your workshop before I head home. Izuku was planning. She was strange, that much wasn't even a question. She was obsessed with her babies, as she put it, to the extent that she swung a wrench at his head when she thought he was going to impede her ability to create. She was clearly intelligent if the portable lightning rod of hers was of any indication. She was off on the voltage for an actual lightning bolt but not helping. He was digressing, and he needed to, think. If she was capable of that, then he may be able to use her mechanical knowledge to supplement his own while he learned. He may just be able to get a business partner out of it, as well. She wanted to stay in support, it would seem and he wouldn't have time as a hero to run all the tests he wanted quickly once he had a license. Certainly something for the future. Izuku picked up his bag, full of parts and, after a second of thought, picked up an old abused guitar that had been resting against a wall of refuse. It had certainly seen better days. It was scuffed to all hell, the finish on it was wearing off, and several of the strings would need to be replaced, but it was still serviceable. Some sandpaper, some new finish, new stain, new strings. Assuming nothing crazy was wrong with, it, it would be good to be able to play again. It would certainly help to keep his mind from wandering. He forcibly stopped the thought line there. All right, Hatsum, let's see this workshop of yours. If his yuka was honest, he had expected a garage with some work benches. Maybe some gadgets strewn around and a few blueprints hanging from the walls. Something similar to what his workshop was, creeping towards. What he was met with was similar but more advanced. Hatsum had a series of machines that would prove useful to her work and a forge against the left wall upon walking in. Straight ahead, the wall was covered in shelves of gadgets, parts, and blueprints. The right wall had piles of scrap against it and what looked like a sad futon that was kind of half resting against the wall, half sagging to the ground. Izuku got the feeling that the futon saw more use than Hatsum's actual bed. The floor was concrete, which was only discernible by either feeling it beneath you or by looking at the edges of the room, 
as the center of the room's concrete had been long singed black from what appeared to be blast marks. The walls were plain, beside the blueprints, gadgets, and plethora of sound dampening pads. Welcome to Casa de la Hatsum. I have almost everything I could want right now in this workshop. I'll have access to better materials and machines once I get into a, of course, but for now, this will do. Izuku quirked his eyebrow at her when she spun in a circle to look at him. Home of the Hatsum? Just how much time do you spend here that you refer to it as home? Hatsum, threw her hands in the air with a grin on her face. All of it. Now, let's get your measurements. I want to adjust a few of my babies. While I do that, you sketch out some of your designs you want my help with or advice on. Hatsum wasted absolutely no time in pulling at his Yuku's bag and rushing him to set his things down. He smiled for the first time in a while. He couldn't help it. Her, single-minded energy was absolutely infectious. All right, Hatsum. Let's get to work then. By the time as Yuku had finished at Hatsum's workshop, the sun was dipping just under the horizon. Its orange hue had long since lost its luster and slipped instead into deep lilac and azure rays streaking through a steadily darkening sky. He chuckled a bit, thinking about his appearance and what others must think of him right now. His hair was pulling itself out of where he had tied it back and was sticking up in multiple places. He was covered in any number of substances ranging from oil and grease to soot from the innumerable explosions that Hatsum somehow managed to cause. Izuku smiled and shook his head, chuckling. How does one even manage to light pneumatic tubing on fire? He had no idea. And likely never would. The walk back home was coming for Izuku. The explosions had set him on edge, even if he had enjoyed the experiments. He had agreed to bring some of his blueprints for them to work on the next time he could stop by. Hatsumi had gotten all starry-eyed when he had shown her sketches of a compact wrist-mounted crossbow and grappling hook design that he was blueprinting. Hopefully, I'll be able to convince her to let me use her forge at some point. Gun laws have come a long way in Japan since the mid-2000s and the early 21st. It's not impossible to get a handgun and carry permit here anymore. I suppose that's one thing I can thank quirks for. Even if they stunted our growth as a species, at least they've made guns seem like useless toys. Which, couldn't be further from the truth, frankly. Pretty sure except for a few percent, most don't have a quirk to deal with a subsonic round much less a supersonic one. Even still, it would be far easier to cast my own parts after carving a resin mold. I doubt I'll find one to my tastes here. Hatsum and I would need to make some serious progress before I go trusting her with potentially, world-changing technologies. The fusion reactors, battery tech to go with, and a lot of my gear will have to wait until I'm sure I can partner with her through it all. I'm sure as hell not trusting a slightly crazy stranger with rail weapons even if she does seem nice. Izuku shifted his bag on his right shoulder, while his left hand held the sad guitar in his left as he stepped up to the door of, his home. He had managed to get the sandpaper in done while bouncing ideas with Hatsum in her workshop, but it still needed a new finish and stained along with a new set of strings. When he entered, he found his mother asleep at the table waiting for him. She looked calm in her sleep without any of the stress that he had initially seen when he first had come home from the hospital. She worries, far too much about me. It's good to see her resting like this. She deserves a good life after what she's put up with to get here. Gently, Izuku put down his bag and the newly sanded guitar before picking his mother up and carrying her back to her room to sleep in her bed. When he returned with a smile on his lips, he picked up his bag before looking around. The smile slid away and his eyes slipped, into ice as he was reminded of Hisashi. I do think that I'll find out what you've been up to, father dearest. Izuku returned to his room after setting his bag and the guitar in his workshop. Sitting down at his computer, he got to work setting up the same encryption scheme and proxy that they had used in the Black Cats. Admittedly, he had to make some minor adjustments owing to the different architecture of the devices, but he made do. Not quite as perfect as Sergeant Reed would have set up, but then again, 
I am pretty sure that man could have brought every nation here on earth to their knees within a week, so that'll have to suffice. The thought caused a sad smile to twitch at his Yuku's lips. The man had been a genius amongst geniuses when it came to technology. The image of a bloody, vest flashed across his eyes. A kind face with a head of blonde hair shaped into a faux hawk. Bright blue eyes, staring up into his own emerald with a smile. He yelled at the man to stay with him. His hands were covered in blood as he desperately tried to stop the bleeding. So much blood that it was everywhere. Up his arms, covering his vest, pulling below the communication sergeant's back. Even if his, medical training told him it was too late, he couldn't stop. Couldn't stop trying. Couldn't lose another black cat. Izuku snapped back to the present with a shuddering breath and a sprint to the bathroom. Desperately, he ran cold water over his pale, clammy skin. As he looked into the mirror, he could still see the horrors that lurked behind his eyes. He clenched them shut and focused on his, breathing. His hands shook even as he used them to splash more cold water on his face. He couldn't think of that now. He had work to do, and it wouldn't help anyone if he thought of that now. He took one last shuddering breath before drying his face and hands. By the time as Yuku had sat back down, he was once again focused on his task. He'd start with the telecommunications servers. He'd get any, record of communication between his mother and Hisashi. If he was simply reading too much into the situation, and was violating her privacy for nothing, then he would drop hit there. But if he found what he expected, he would then move on to I Island's servers. Those would be a little harder to manage since the security supposedly rivaled the supposedly non-existent, clearly existent prison, Tartarus. Even if it was technically supposed to be a secret facility, it had long since been exposed to the public. But much like Guantanamo Bay in the 21st, people would prefer to simply look away rather than confront the harsh truth of what their society did to villains. If Izuka found what he expected to find, then Hisashi would wish that he was in Tartarus rather than I Island. Izuku glanced at his clock when he heard his mother getting up for the day. Quietly, he saved and then closed the information documents he had been compiling. Eight in the morning and what he had found since he began digging had caused him to long since pass disgust. He had long since passed rage. Now what sat within him was a cold fury that would make Hisashi rue the day he was ever born. While, his mother and Hisashi had talked a bit since the coma, for the most part, almost all communication had ceased from him. As it turned out, when his mother had said that she was told to not worry about him, what had actually happened is that there was a long argument regarding their quirkless child finally becoming less of a problem for everyone. From there, what he found only spiraled. The man was, a quirkist asshole that loved lording his power over his department. From the video camera footage he had managed to strip out of their mainframes, it turned out that the man was sleeping with at least three members of said department. That's not even to mention the other dozen or so violations of his contract, much less human decency. The man wouldn't be getting away with his actions or behavior. Even if he had to fly to the damn island himself to wring his neck. Deep breaths. You can't do anything about it now. Just catalog and compile his actions. You'll get your chance to deal with him. You left your monitor on their servers before you GT booted by their security systems. You'll have plenty to crucify him with soon enough. Izuku stepped out into the kitchen and hugged his mother from, behind. She was debating what to make for breakfast when he slipped up behind her. Inko was momentarily startled before realizing it was Izuku. Well aren't you up early today? What do you want for breakfast today, Izu? Izuku shook his head and ushered her towards the living room. I'll make breakfast this morning. You go sit and drink your coffee. Inko sputtered slightly at the forceful way that she was ejected from her kitchen. But she certainly wasn't going to argue with Izuku making breakfast. Wait, when did he learn how to cook? Has he been paying that much attention to what I've been doing? Meanwhile in the kitchen, Izuku quickly took stock of what he had to work with and started cooking. High protein would be good, considering his routine. When he had finished the cooking, he brought it out to his mother at the table. 
eggs with furrow cake, a small salad, and a miso soup. I'm certain it isn't as good as your cooking, Mom, but I thought you might want to be the one cooked for, for once. Inko smiled at her son. It smells delicious, honey. I'm sure it'll be great. She and Izuku dug into their breakfast, making small talk while doing so. She spoke of some of the dishes, she'd been perfecting at work in preparation of adding them to the menu. When asked, Izuku spoke of what his schedule looked like for the day. He'd do a bit more school work, probably finish out his junior year before the end of the week, before heading out to the beach to continue his work. I'll likely head off the beach earlier than usual from now on. I met someone yesterday, and we spent some, time working on some designs at her workshop. I'm hoping I'll be able to make a business partner out of her in the future. After that, I'll likely head over to the local music store in the next couple of days to pick up some strings for a guitar that I've been working on Rooster is Yuku cut off when he looked up from his food to find his mother staring at him wide-eyed. Before he could ask what was, wrong, she cried out. My Izuku has met a girl. The Madraya family tears had made their appearance. When do I get to meet her? What is she like? What does she plan on doing in the future? You have to tell me everything Ko was cut off by Izuku laughing, a smile spread across his face. Mom. Mom, stop Izuku tried to rein in his laughter. Catching his breath, he continued. Nothing is going on, she's tentatively a friend at most right now. Like I said, I hope I'll be able to make her my business partner in the future. I can answer a few of those questions though. I don't know when you'll get to meet her, as I'm not sure she spends much if not the minimum time outside of her workshop than what is required of her. She's passionate is the word I'll use, about her work. Is you could decided it, would be best to leave out precisely how they had met. She's planning on becoming a hero support technician which is why she latched on to me. She knows I plan on becoming a hero and wants to work with me to make us both the best in our fields. Inko had frozen at the mention of the hero course. Her smile became tense and barely did Inko manage not to let it turn into a frown. Izuku spoke softly. When he saw this, his tone turning more serious and somber, his smile becoming smaller but at the same time soft, as well. I know you don't like the idea. Mom. I'm sorry that I worry you, and don't deny that it's a major concern of yours. Izuku shook his head. No. I know that you worry about my safety. That you worry if I take this path, I'll get myself seriously injured or worse because of my lack of ick work. But mom, I can't help but take the path that'll let me save the most lives. Help the most people. Inko opened her mouth to respond but, once again, Izuku shook his head. I know what you're going to say. Why not the police? Why not be a doctor? I got Hisashi's intelligence from him, so why not become a support technician like my friend? Izuku let those questions hang in the air for a moment. I've already thought about those options, Mom, and they aren't the path for me. The police would be just as dangerous. While unnoticed, they are still at the scene of every hero operation. I can't just help people after they've been injured, so being a doctor is out. Not that I won't pursue that route to some degree, it just can't be the only thing I do. Izuku let the implications of that sink, in. Inko didn't try to say anything this time. She stared into Izuku's eyes, so emerald like her own, searching for something. Some hint of hesitation she could use, could play off to keep her son safe. Izuku reached across the table now and took her hands in his own. I can't promise you that I'll always come back home safe. I won't lie to you. I can't promise that I'll always be safe when I'm in the field. My first priority will always be an innocent civilian safety and survival before my own. Inka watched as her son's eyes saw something in the distance that she couldn't. Those familiar emerald eyes were now far older than they had any right to be. When he spoke, he spoke with an experience that was impossible for him. Yet it was there. The gravity of his words hung in the air. The job I'm planning on performing isn't safe, you're right. Any number of things could happen. 
but I can't leave an innocent person in a situation when I could do something about it. What I can promise you, is Yuku squeezed his mother's hands as he took a deep breath, surfacing from whatever memory he was in, is that at the end of the day, I'll do my best to come back. I'll do my best to make sure, everyone gets out safe. This is my home, and that is always worth fighting for. Always worth protecting. Inko fought the urge to cry. To beg him to please reconsider, to take some safe position in a remote hospital for her. But she couldn't. She could see his face when the doctor had diagnosed him quirkless. Could still see his face when she said she was sorry that night. Sorry for so many, things. The Izuku she saw in front of her now, though, wasn't the same scared young boy he used to be. He had grown so much without her even noticing it. He had made up his mind, and while a few tears slipped out, she couldn't, no. Wouldn't discourage him any further. All right. Inka managed to choke out the word around her emotions. Be careful, okay? That's all I suppose I can ask of you. Both, Midrayas gave each other sad smiles before his mother processed something that came before the dark returned to their conversation. What do you mean done with your junior year? Dot as Yuku sighed as Hatsum once again ran her numbers, flailing as she did so. How is this possible? It isn't possible. There is no way your muscles and bones are this dense. That's not possible for a human being. Are you certain you don't have an enhancer quirk that you're not aware of? Hatsum frantically clawed at her hair, looking at the same results from the last three times she had run the numbers. Izuku shook his head. He had told her several times at this point he was quirkless, but she continued to doubt him. Though seeing numbers like the ones that she was looking at, it didn't surprise him why. It, had been an important step for them. If she had reacted negatively to him being quirkless, then he would have dropped her immediately. No, Hatsum. I've not any quirk, like I've said multiple times, and as I was saying regarding the suit, we're just going to have to make my gear capable of underwater combat, especially since my muscle and bones will only get denser. The rebreather will be an important part of that. Hatsum spun to look at him at the forge from where she was at her desk. Midraya, the average human muscle is about 1.06 kilograms per liter. Your muscle density is already triple that and you telling me it's going to get denser? This has to be a quirk. There is no other way you could possibly be like this. Hatsum paced as as you could put the final touches on what would be the cast for the slide of a handgun. It had been easy enough to get her permission to make something. She was so excited to work with another person, he's pretty sure he could have proposed a nuclear warhead and she'd have said yes. Hatsum, if you want, you can have a sample of my blood to run for quirk factor. Of which, you won't find even if you find a way to get the equipment to run the blood, is Yuku set aside the cast of the slide with the other parts that he had completed and stood up stretching. Regardless. It doesn't change what needs to be done or just how badly it needs to be a part of the design. I have no interest in drowning simply because I didn't take the precautions and ran into a damn water bending quirk. Hatsum pouted at him. Obviously I have no problem putting it in, the design, but if we aren't careful, then the design is just going to get outdated when new suddenly sprout fins and gills. Also, don't go throwing Atla references at me to sass me. Izuku smirked and grabbed his bag, currently empty of scrap, and the guitar that had been drying of its final stain layer. All that was left was to get the new strings. That's fair enough. You've not had the prior, experience with this I have. I'll see you again tomorrow and we'll start working on the prototype for the gauntlet. Sound good? Izuku conceded the point, and Hatsum smiled. They had reworked the design on the wrist crossbow to be modular. The gauntlet would serve as a base for the modules to snap to on the fly, in case he needed to change out what was on his arm or a module got trashed. In addition, Hatsum believed she had come up with a way to minimize the bulk of it until it was effectively mounting to an undersuit that would cover him like a wetsuit. If they could get the idea operating, it would allow them a lot of leeway in the actual gear. Besides that, if Izuku could find a way to replicate Austin here on Earth, 
he shook that idea away. That would require facilities that he simply wouldn't have access to. Even if he could remember the exact makeup of the material, which he could, he didn't have any way to recreate it. Izuku quickly found himself on a train to the local commercial district. While it wasn't quite as large, diverse, or generally as populous as if he went into the city, the music store there was well liked by the area, and he figured he'd go somewhere, close. He got off the train and worked his way through the streets until he had reached the storefronts. He found his destination right beside a small family-run market in Delhi. It was a quaint little neighborhood, and if Izuku had to resort to using the GPS on his phone, then no one would have to know. Upon entry into the store, Izuku could see that he was in the right place. Organized rows of instruments lined the walls and show floor. He wandered over to the guitars with his stringless one to find a new set and realized very quickly that he was out of his depth. Steel, nickel, brass, bronze, nylon. Besides that, there were different string cores, winding types, and coatings. An employee evidently had seen his distress, as she had made her way over to him before tapping him on the shoulder. May I help you, sir? The girl was about his age, he noticed. Slender and fair-skinned, she was several inches shorter than him. Short, purple hair sat cropped just above her shoulders, but the most prominent features were her two plug-like jacks where her earlobes were. Izuku chuckled nervously. Is it that obvious I needed the help? Izuku gave her a small, nervous smile. I'm looking to get strings for this. Izuku handed the guitar to the girl as he explained. My friend who taught me how to play was also the one that dealt with these kinds of things. So I have absolutely no idea what I'm looking for here. Izuku gestured to the wall of string types and varieties. So in this case, I'd love your help. Izuku looked down at the tag on her shirt. Miss Jiro. Jiro snorted, still enraptured by the guitar. You don't need to call me Miss. We're the same age by the look of things. Jiro ran her hands up the body of the guitar, admiring the rune-like carvings in the stained surface, as well as the carefully hand-carved icon of a black cat sitting on a moon in the lower right of the guitar. This is amazing work. Who did you have do this for you? I know all of the guitar, makers in the area, and I don't recognize this work. And what are these symbols? Is that ancient Greek? Izuku smiled down at the guitar. It was always nice to have your work recognized. Especially if it was someone clearly so enthusiastic about instruments. I've been working on this carefully for the last couple of days. I'm glad you like it, and no, not ancient Greek. Something like that, though. Jiro's head whipped up. You did this in only a couple days. The woodworking on this would imply weeks. That's amazing. What does it say? Izuku continued to smile practically beaming at her praise. It's an old quote from the 19th century author Minute J. Savage. It holds a bit of personal meaning for me. Same with the icon of the cat. The brave die never, though they sleep in, dust, their courage nerves a thousand living men. Izuku's smile had taken on a sad tinge, and Jiro looked at him slightly confused but could see the meaning behind the words all the same. Well, mister? Jiro held the guitar at its heel in her left hand and reached out with her right. Izuku looked up from the guitar where he had been staring distantly at the engraved symbols and shook her hand, Midraya Izuku, well, Midraya, let's get you strung up, shall we? You have, in my opinion, two options for an acoustic guitar like this. Jiro turned to the wall and started pointing out strings to Izuku. I personally think the nylon strings sound better when they're being picked, but steel strings sound better when they're strummed. She glanced over and took one of Izuku's hands in her own. You certainly, have the calluses that steel strings wouldn't be an issue. They tend to hurt people's fingers until they have calluses built up. The nylon strings contribute a warmer, mellower sound to the guitar and are well suited to genres like classical and folk. Meanwhile. The steel strings would be better suited for most other things. Izuku took the information in as she threw it at him, and he made his decision by the time she had finished. I'll go with steel strings. 
A lot of what I've learned to play leans more towards what would be considered classical or folk, but I think it would be better to have the range. Jiro smiled at that and brought him to the counter. I'll get this strung up for you, and after that's done, we can get you checked out. It'll only take a bit to restring the guitar. But it could take an hour or two of playing to break in the strings and let them stay in tune. If you are interested, we could take it over to the deli after I've restrung it. I'd love to hear you play some. If that is that your playing skills are half of your woodworking. Izuku quirked his eyebrow at that, still smiling, though a little embarrassed at the offer. Do all employees take such a personal interest in every instrument that comes through? Jiro blew out her cheeks, slightly pink at that, and looked away. Look, it's been a slow day, and you are by far the most interesting person to come in here lately. Don't let it go to your head. As for the few minutes until close after that, I'm sure my parents can handle it. It's our place, and like I said, it's been slow. Madraya, smiled and agreed. It would be good to get feedback from someone that, apparently, came from a musical family. He was certain he was likely rusty. It was practically no time before they found themselves sitting at a table out in front of the dilly with drinks and small sandwiches. Him with a freshly strung guitar and her with one that she had pulled from the back of the shop. For a while they, didn't play, they sat and talked while finishing off the snack they had picked up. They spoke of many things. What it was like to work in the shop funny little anecdotes, his projects, some of her ideas for projects. Izuku had learned that her parents were musicians as well as owning the shop. He actually recognized their names when he heard them in full. They weren't world class but they were, certainly popular within Japan. When they did play, the air was filled with a serenade of notes. A warm melody that eased the heart and made one think of the good days. Jiro was absolutely blown away by the young man that had come in the shop looking for strings for what appeared to be an exotic guitar. Then he began to sing. In what language, she had no idea, but the message still came through, all the same. It sounded like a story of love, loss, and redemption. One that made a heart cry out for better times before Izuku returned to those steady, warm days. So is that what you want to do? follow in their footsteps and become a musician? Izuku asked her as he finished cleaning up his area. She tensed and frowned before sighing and looking down at her hands. I'll admit, I'm not sure, anymore. Used to, I would have said yes to that without hesitation. But lately, I don't know anymore. I want to help people, but I'm not sure how to do it. Should I go to a hero school? Should I be a musician? Does that make sense? Jiro looked up to find Izuku nodding. He knew very well what that feeling was like and stated as such. I had that very struggle recently myself, so I know all too, well. I decided to get a hero license to help people, but is that the only way? No, not at all. Is that the best way to help people? Maybe. Maybe not. That's arguable on multiple fronts and from multiple points for both ways. Police, firefighters, doctors, there are any number of careers that help people. Even musicians, in their own way, have a special ability to inspire that many other careers, don't. If that's the case, what do I do? I hate this feeling of indecision. You seem so resolute in your decision. As corny as it sounds, Jiro. All I can really say is to follow your heart. I didn't simply look at the pros and cons and go, ah, yes, this appears to be the best way. Izuku shook his head. No, quite the opposite. All of the options seemed like good ones. I simply went with the, one I felt would suit me the best. Maybe it might not be apparent to you right now, but I'm sure you'll get there. Here, let's do this. Izuku pulled a 10 yen coin out of his pocket and held it up for Jiro to see. This isn't definite, but I find it helps sort out your feelings occasionally. If the coin lands on the musician's side and you feel disappointed, then it certainly clears up your subconscious thoughts on the matter, yes? Izuku flipped the coin into the air, but while Jiro's eyes were on the coin, 
is you coos were looking through the window of the deli and straight at a robber holding up the kind old man who had served them their food. Before the coin even hit the table, Izuku was moving to intercept. By the time Izuku had stepped through the doors, the robber was already, starting to get twitchy. The old man wasn't moving as fast as the robber would have liked and the robber had a handgun pointed directly at the old man. Where the hell did he get it from? Japan may be more relaxed, but they are still stringent as hell regarding it. Hey! What do you think you're doing? Izuku called out to the robber, his hands already in the air when the man whipped around, face, startled and eyes desperate. No signs of drug use. Pupils are steady if not a bit large from adrenaline. Seems coherent. Why are you doing this? Izuku asked the man this calmly, as if it were the most obvious thing to be asked right then. What does it matter? The man bites out the reply. It doesn't matter at this point anyway. He jerked the gun back to the old man yelling at him to hurry, before swinging it back towards Izuku who had crept slightly closer. Look. Right now, you're in trouble. I won't lie and tell you that you aren't. But right now, you haven't done anything you can't come back from. Izuku looked across the man, catching any details he could use to talk him down. He didn't want to have to hurt someone if he didn't have to. A wedding band, so he's married. His eyes, flicked across his clothing where various hair was stuck to it. Do you have a family? A pet? Izuku calmly asked the man his questions. Gotta keep in talking. Keep his attention on me. The man grit his teeth as he looked at Izuku. I have two daughters. My wife died a month ago. We have a calico that wanders in and out if you can consider that a pet. The gun was still trained on Izuku, but he, had his attention now. I'm sorry to hear that. Izuku frowned. I've lost a good number of people, and I know how hard that is. It must be rough taking care of your daughters now on your own. How old are they? The man licked his lips, gun drooping slightly as he thought about his children. It is. It's so hard. They're four and six. How do you explain to your daughters at that age why you can't? eat dinner every night or why they never get to see you because you're always working? The man was getting agitated again and starting to twitch. It's hard to tell someone that young something like that. You can't expect them to understand. Their happiness is your responsibility, and you can see that slipping away from you far too quickly. But think about them right now. Like I said, right now, you're in trouble, but you haven't passed the point of no return. If you want them to be happy, you can't go through with this. What would they think of what you're doing right now? What would you tell them about this? Everyone needs help sometimes, that's nothing to be ashamed of. Just hand me the gun. We can still both walk away from this. Yes. You can go back home to your daughters. The man, seemed to struggle for a moment before breaking. All right, he choked out. I don't want this to be how my daughters remember me. The man was so close to handing over the gun when the door slammed open and death arms came running in. The man snapped the gun back up a frantic look in his eyes before strafing his gun across both death arms and Jiro now standing in the doorway. What happened next, ran in slow motion for his Yuku. Death arm slammed his fist into the robber's stomach. The robber fired when his body clenched from the impact and the gun was pointed straight at Jiro. Izuku was already moving and had just enough time to dive and grab Jiro before the bullet skimmed through his right tricep. No sooner had the robber hit the floor out cold than Izuku was up and yelling at death arms, you goddamn idiot. I was seconds away from defusing the situation before you broke through the front door. Izuku jerked his left arm at the glass double doors that were now shattered. Besides that, Rather than disarm the man, you chose to punch him. The body clenches when it's hit you asshole. You damn near got an innocent civilian killed because of your inability to deal with the situation, properly. Death Arm simply stared as Yuku down as he yelled at him before grunting back. Look, I know you're probably upset about getting shot, boy, but don't yell at the man that just saved your life. The villain needed to be taken down, and that's what I did. 
A couple doors aren't anything compared to a bullet through your chest or head when the villain decided to stop toying with you, Izuku simply stared at the man in horror before turning on his heel shaking his head and moving to Jiro. Are you alright? He helped her to her feet before hissing when she poked his right arm. Am I alright? Are you alright? You've been shot. Jiro was frantically gesturing to Izuku's bleeding arm. I'm fine. It just grazed me, Izuku muttered right after that it wasn't the first time he'd been, shot. He didn't realize that Jiro could hear him at that volume and didn't catch it on her face as he began tearing his shirt apart to triage the flesh wound. They would have to state to speak with the police as soon as they arrived, and oh boy did Izuku want a word with them regarding their hero. Izuku glanced over and picked up his 10 yen coin. Hey, look at that, Izuku smirked up at his, companion. Looks like it landed on Hiro. Little did he know that Jiro had already made her decision, it wasn't long before the crowd started gathering around the deli. Be it from the excitement of something happening in the sleepy suburb of Mujutafu, or that the area was now being barricaded by police and first responders. The shattered glass of the doorway was spread across the ground inside the deli as if an explosion had forced the doors off their hinges inwards. Jiro sat anxiously in one of the chairs to the side while the paramedics argued with Izuku. Her parents had been allowed to come out of the store and wait for the police to take Yoka's statement with her. I'm telling you. I do not need to go to the hospital. The bullet skimmed the lateral head at most. Put a few stitches in my arm and I'll heal fine as long as I keep it disinfected. Izuku had been having this argument for a few minutes now and his patience had already been wearing thin before the paramedics over enthusiastic treatment of his flesh wound. Izuku had managed to keep death arms in his line of sight since the robbery ended. First, he had been giving his report to the first on the scene. So at least he had done part of his job. But then, Directly after he got done shoving the poor robber into the back of the police cruiser, he had immediately gone over to talk with the media who had managed to come crawling out of the woodwork at the mention of a villain attack. The paramedic finally relented, fine. You just want stitches and not any of the dozen healing quirks that could help you along? Fine. I'll leave it at that and let the police have you. The first responder, who had become just as Aggravated with his Yuku as his Yuku had with him, signaled to the waiting officers before storming off with the signed release forms. His Yuku took in the two men that were approaching his Yuku's little group in detail. If his Yuku wanted to get his story across and help the man who'd had the chance to stand down stripped from him, then he'd have to play this carefully. One was a lean man that clearly had some form of cat quirk in him. He was lithe with yellow eyes and the, for the most part, body of a ginger tabby cat. Beside him was a tall man that was about as plain as they came. He, like his partner, wore a tan overcoat and matching hat that made the two look like they would have come from some noir film were it not, of course, for the furry ears poking through the hat of the cat. Hello there. The, plain man spoke first when the two stepped up in front of his Yuku and company. I am Detective Tsukaki Namasa. This is my partner Detective Tomikawa Sansa. I was told that you were the witness to the villain attack. Also, be aware that anything you say I can verify as true with my quirk. Izuku quirked his eyebrow at the detectives. You have a lie detector quirk? Izuku asked, curious. It would, certainly be useful in his profession. Indeed I do. I always inform victims of attacks. It helps to make them believe we'll take what they tell us seriously. Tsukaki nodded his head at Izuku's question. I'll be needing to get statements from both you, Mr. Madraya, as well as Miss Jiro. Izuku smiled, because for the first time during all of this, something was going very right. That makes this easy then, detective. Izuku's smile turned sharp with just a hint of his underlying rage seeping through into it. Let me be the first to inform you at the scene of this villain attack that the man was not a villain at all. Quite to the contrary, I saw a man scared for his family, driven to commit a crime by desperation and not ill will. Despite, as you could practically spit the word, the complete opposite being told to the media right now. 
is you could jerk his thumb at death arms standing in front of a news camera and allow the smile now to drop off his face and the disdain to come through. In fact, the only damage that was incurred during this attack was inflicted by death arms slamming himself through the door. Izuku gestured stiffly to the shattered remains of the front, entrance to the deli. Or by the man's handgun, Izuku gestured to the bullet wound in his right arm, which would have never gone off if the supposed hero in this situation hadn't punched the scared, anxious man who was about to surrender his weapon to me. Both detectives had stiffened during Izuku's recounting of the events, and Detective Tamakawa looked to his partner for verification, regarding Izuku's statement. Everything he's said is true so far. What do you mean he was about to surrender his weapon to you, Mr. Madraya? Namasa asked him this follow-up. A knot was forming in his stomach, as was the feeling that this was about to turn into a massive headache. Jiro spoke up at this before as Yuku could respond. Of course everything he said is true. He managed to almost talk, down an armed gunman and would have without the interference from death arms over there. Even then, if as Yuku hadn't acted how he did, Ijiro cut off and shuddered slightly, wrapping her arms around herself. It was just catching up to her that she had almost died back there. She had begun to shake and her breathing was becoming hitched. Her parents gave her a worried look, but before either of them could do anything, a hand was placed on her shoulder and she could hear a soft voice calling her name. When she looked up, she found herself staring into the deep emerald eyes of the man that had literally taken a bullet for her. Hey there, Jiro. Focus on me now. What you are feeling is scary, but it is not dangerous. You are all right, you're here with your parents. There is nothing that is going to hurt you anymore. Focus on breathing. One, two, three. There you go. Deep breaths. Izuku looked away from Jiro, away from where he was now kneeling in front of her, helping the poor girl through a panic attack, and into the two detectives' eyes. I do think that you can get her statement later, yes? You can allow her parents to take her inside their shop here. She only came in at the end and I can explain what happened from my perspective. Which should be more than enough for the moment, yes? Izuku's voice was still soft and calm, but there was a bite to it now. A threat for the detectives that there would be hell to pay if they didn't go along with his very reasonable request. Yes, that is fine. Detective Tomakawa said as Tsukaki nodded along with his partner. You're free, to go, Miss Jiro. Jiro's father helped his daughter back into the shop before anything else could happen. But her mother waited for a moment and approached Izuku instead before folding herself into a bow. Thank you so much. Thank you for saving our daughter. Please come back tomorrow or the next time you get the chance. I'm sure Kyoko will want to thank you herself, as well as my husband. Izuku, gave her a smile before telling her not to bow. I didn't do anything special. Ma'am. I couldn't have lived with myself if I let her get hurt, after all. Mrs. Jiro gave him a concerned look before as Yuku turned back to the detectives. When he did so, he stood at parade dressed, the soft, caring expression he had used with Jiro melting away like the spring snow. Yes, sir, as I said, the man was about to hand over his weapon when death arms ruined everything. I had been negotiating with him for several minutes to discolate. He was just about to surrender and hand over his weapon when death arms came crashing through the door, spooking the man into raising his weapon again. Unfortunately, he also decided the correct course of action would be to punch the man pointing a deadly weapon at an innocent civilian. Which of course as Yuka was cut off when Namasa sighed out, pinching the bridge of his nose caused the weapon to go off when the man clenched from the impact, resulting in you saving Miss Jiro from the bullet and death arms nearly killing an innocent civilian. He had been right. It was about to turn into a massive headache. I'm going to need you to come back to the station, with me please, Mr. Madraya. If he was willing to surrender to you, then he's more likely to open up to you than me or my partner. You already have the rapport established with him. I'll be honest with you, detective, I thought I was going to have to fight you on this matter. I still think that the man is a criminal, don't get me wrong, 
he broke the law. But he certainly is not a villain. But, I wasn't quite certain that you were going to see things the same way considering. Well. Izuku didn't need to gesture this time for the two detectives to understand what Izuku was getting at. Yes, well, I'm afraid had I not heard your side of the story, I may very well have let this slide, as what it appears to be on the surface. However, neither of us are in the business of overcharging, criminals, either. Come on, we'll head over to the station now and you can give us a full briefing on the negotiation on the way there. Then we'll go from there. Namasa stopped and realized what he had just said. He was talking to a civilian. Why was he acting like Madraya was one of his men? Before he could say anything, Izuku nodded with a yes sir, picked up his things and began to make his way to the two detectives' vehicle. Namasa was only able to stare at his back, confused for a moment, before following him to the vehicle. It wasn't even half an hour later that Izuku was sitting in the office of Detective Tsukaki Namasa, thinking that no matter what world it was, people were fucked up. The detective had left Izuku in his office to go convince the prosecutor to hold off, that the case wasn't quite as cut and dry as it seemed. Meanwhile, Izuku was left to wait in the detective's office. As Izuku was waiting for the detective, two things happened. The first was that his mother had caught news of the villain attack, as well as his involvement in it. The panicking woman had taken a few minutes to calm down, to assure that he was fine and would be returning home as soon as he was no longer needed at the police station. The second was that the case board set up in the corner caught his attention. A series of photos were pinned across it. Different scenes, different victims, different methods of execution. The only thing that was readily apparent, that linked the three cases was that all three victims were professional heroes. But there was something there. It was perplexing because Izuku was sure of it. When Namasa returned to his office only a few minutes later, he found Izuku standing in front of his case board with a face of dread. Those three cases have all occurred within the last month. We're working on tracking down leads, but for, the most part, they've gone cold. There just isn't anything that seems to point to the killer except for all three victims being heroes, and in that case, there could be any number of people that could want to target them. Izuku turned slowly, looking Namasa directly in the eyes when doing so. Three cases? There's your first problem. This was all done by the same person or group. This is one, singular case with multiple victims. Namasa was about to dismiss Izuku's words when his quirk told him that Izuku was telling the truth. He at the very least believed what he was saying, and going with his gut, Namasa asked him why he thought so. Izuku pointed to the board. Everything lines up. First of all, all three were killed in sequential weeks from each other. Each exactly a week apart, while that could be a coincidence, the other little details say otherwise. Each one was taken down with a different weapon in an isolated location, and each has small cuts and scrapes on them which would indicate each was in a struggle of some kind before their death. That, in and of itself, isn't surprising, especially in the case of a hero fatality. Where it starts to get suspicious, however, is, here. Izuku pointed to each of the coroner reports and their lab results. You have three separate coroners from different parts of the city sending you lab results where each victim has incredibly high counts of COP++ ions in their sarcoplasm. Izuku looked back to where Namasa stood with a puzzled expression on his face. This means that before their deaths, each of the victims' bodies would, have completely tensed up to the point of their muscles practically locking them in place. They would be effectively paralyzed until their body stopped signaling and their sarcolemma and T-tubules repolarized. Izuku let those words sink in and could see the realization dawning on Namasa's face as it gained the same serious look Izuku's had. What you're telling me is that all three victims, while being killed by different methods, were effectively all paralyzed before their deaths? Namasa calmly asked his question of Izuku even if his mind was racing with the implications. That is indeed what I am saying, and it doesn't stop there. Each of these heroes had come up with controversy of some kind in the weeks leading up to their deaths. Izuku began to point to each in turn. Bright, 
Shadow recently had a report come out regarding the number of civilians blinded by their quirk when they used it on villains. Night Owl was recently criticized for his seeming inability to bring in criminals without maiming them with his talons, and finally, Thornhead here was recently mobbed by a group of civilians and was startled. This wouldn't have been a major incident worth mentioning if, in, his surprise, he hadn't shot his spines into half a dozen civilians, injuring them. What you have is someone or some eons targeting heroes because they aren't up to standard. In the case of an organization, maybe they've come up with some kind of chemical cocktail to do this, or in the case of an individual, maybe a quirk that can somehow broadcast the signal to their victims' bodies. Regardless of, how and why, whoever is doing this is incredibly dangerous and knows what they're doing. Namasa plopped down into his desk seat with a bone-weary sigh. Shit. That isn't good. All right, I'll have to verify what it you just told me regarding the paralysis, but if that checks out, it's all sound logic, and a damn good theory, if not an ugly one. Namasa looked up at his yuka from where he had his face, in his hands. I don't suppose you would be interested in an analyst position with us? I've been staring at that board for a week, and you just managed to link those three cases together in under 45 minutes. Izuku shook his head at Namasa. Sorry, sir, I'm almost out of high school, and while it is true that I would have more time during my degree programs, I am also working on several technologies to aid me in getting into a hero program. If you could use my help, I have no problem working as a civilian consultant occasionally. But I simply don't have the time to commit to a full-time position as an analyst. Just my luck. I find a damn good analyst and he's already set on his path. Oh well, just the offer of occasional help if we need it is better than I was expecting to get, I'll deal with this issue later. Come on, we have an interview to do. Detective Tsukaki entering interview with civilian witness Madraya is Yuku. The detective recited the pertinent data, and after reading the man his rights, sat down across from him. For the record, please correct me if I am wrong. Namasa began, you are one Fuji E. Nao, age 34 and born in the Fukushima War. You, moved here some seven months ago for work with your wife, who passed away a month ago. Was any of that incorrect? What does it matter? The man sounded sad, bitter, and defeated. You're just going to throw me away in jail as another villain anyways. Take my daughters away to go into some system. Izuku spoke up now his voice soft and comforting. Inviting the man to look at him and trust what, he was saying to him. Mr. Fujii, like I told you back at the deli, you are in trouble, but not to the degree that you seem to think you are. We are simply trying to ascertain the exact events of what went down for the police record. Detective Tsukaki here is very good at telling if you are lying and will be able to tell that you are giving an accurate account of what happened. The man's head jerked up at Izuku's voice. His mouth hung open for a second before stuttering out a surprised croak that it was him. Why would you go this far to help me? I tried to rob the store. I shot you. Did you mean to shoot me? Did you mean for anyone to get injured at any point during your actions? Izuku pressed the man now, and Namasa allowed him to take the lead. If the man was willing to cooperate with Izuku, then he would gladly be sidelined and verify the information. Of course not, God no. The man choked out. I never intended to even fire the weapon. I was going to give it over to you before that man punched me. The man returned his head to his hands before croaking out. I just wanted to get enough money to feed my kids. Namasa nodded his head and gave the camera the signal that everything that had been said was the truth then tapped Izuku in a signal to continue. And continue Izuku did. By the end of an exhausting half an hour interview, Izuku had grilled the man from every angle Tsukaki could think of and then some. Where the hell he had learned how to do that was beyond him, but it was more than evident to himself and everyone involved by this point, that the man was just as much a victim as everyone else. There was a quick rap at the door before a tall woman in her mid-thirties came through. She was all business from head to toe, and both her wardrobe and demeanor showed it. Hello, Mr. Fujii. 
My name is Mia Kimi, and I am one of the assistant prosecutors for this area's local prosecutor's office. Contrary to popular belief, not every villain caught by our illustrious heroes is the same. That's where our wonderful police department comes in to weave out the cases actually worth the time and effort to prosecute. Izuku quirked his eyebrow and looked over to the detective. Namasa only gave a small smirk. Right now as it stands, you would be charged with attempted robbery with a deadly weapon. This will confer onto you a minimum sentence of 16 months, plus any time you would await trial. Fuji's face drained of blood as his life flashed before his eyes. Mia sighed, toning down the aggressive tone. That being said, I'm going to offer you an alternative option. In all honesty, this is not a case I, or I'm willing to bet anyone in this room, has any interest in prosecuting. This is your first offense, and as such, the court is willing to offer you a 16-month probation, instead. You will be assigned a position with one of several companies we have an agreement with. Should you be fired, you don't check in with your probation officer accordingly, or perform some other action to violate the terms of the agreement I am going to outline for you, then you will be immediately remanded into police custody to await trial for these charges, as well as any additional ones that may be brought against you. As the prosecutor continued her explanation, Izuku and the detective slipped from the interrogation room and back into Namasa's office. Both sighed, one happy with the outcome of the day's work, the other knowing that this was just the start to his night. Izuku spoke up then. I do believe that, completes my role in this, yes? If it is alright with you, I have a very worried mother back at home and would like to get back to her. If for some reason you need to get into contact with me or are wanting to request assistance, you can reach me here. Izuku handed Namasa a piece of paper that had come from the desk with his contact information on it. Yes, it does, thank you for your assistance in this matter, as well as the insights on the the case that I'm working. He gestured to the board with all of the photos. Your help in these matters has been invaluable. Izuku laid in bed that night with images flashing across the back of his eyes. Variations of what could have happened that day. If he hadn't been able to talk the man down, if he had had to hurt, him or worse to stop someone else from getting injured. The image of Jiro bleeding out on the concrete flashed unbidden into his mind. He hissed and sat up, rubbing his eyes. There hadn't even been anything they could do about death arms outside of submitting a complaint to the Hero Commission. For all the good that would do. He was tired, but he didn't know enough to satiate the feeling lurking, in the back of his gut. He needed an information network in place. He needed to make sure he could at least reasonably see these things coming in the future, and for that, he needed to get back to work. So he did what he did best. He slid out of bed, situated himself in front of his computer with some coffee, and got to work. Hatsum woke up like any other day in her schedule. She rolled out of bed with her body protesting, practically begging her to give it more of the sleep that she deprives it of constantly. She attempted to shower off some of the grime that had embedded itself into her skin before she passed out, brushed her teeth, and generally got ready for the day. She had decided that this morning she was going, to check on one of the simulations that she had left running on her computer for the grapple gauntlet before heading to the private school that her family had enrolled her in. Not that she needed the school, despite what her parents thought. She was so far ahead in her classes that it was a joke. She was fairly certain that if it hadn't been for the social interaction that they had apparently, deemed necessary for her, then she would have been able to convince them to let her do that nifty schooling method Madraya was currently doing. Her rival was getting ahead of her because of that. She stopped midstep on the way to the garage that held her workshop. She supposed she shouldn't call him that, should she? He was someone she could consider her partner now, and it had been so long since she had been able to say that. He was brilliant and, she would admit, just as crazy as her, if some of his designs were of any indication. She knew he hadn't shown her his best stuff yet, either. When she did finally step in the garage, she was surprised to find the man she had just been thinking of already sitting at one of the desks with a pair of magnifying glasses on, soldering what? 
appeared to be the smallest chipset that she had ever seen in her life. She checked her watch just to make sure she hadn't gotten up later than she had intended. I know that Mandraya told me he doesn't have to sleep much, wouldn't that be nice, but what is he doing here at just past six in the morning? Midraya, Hatsum tried to catch his attention, but he didn't respond. She tried rapping on, the door rather loudly with a wrench from where she stood, but still no luck. He was just staring at the chipset without moving. Finally, she simply walked up and placed her hand on his shoulder. The reaction she got put her heart in her throat. Izuku jumped. Not the kind of startled, haha you scared me jump, but the kind you got from startling someone that was running on adrenaline. Madraya's hand shot across the desk to the handgun that he had finished several days prior. It was a sleek little thing that he had chambered in .45 ACP. It was mostly black metal except for the polymer grip. He had installed a flashlight just under the barrel almost like a second barrel that had been filled. He also made the parts to rechamber it down to 9 millimeters, as well as attach a silencer. Though none of, it was technically legal at the moment. He had opted to leave it in the workshop, as he hadn't had the time to go get the licensing completed to carry it. She would have shuddered at the thought of all that paperwork, were said handgun not now pressed against the carotid artery in her neck. Izuku's hand was clamped around the wrist of the hand that had been on his shoulder, and his wild, bloodshot, eyes were darting around, searching her face. Finally, he croaked out a singular, Hatsum, before stumbling back and slapping the sidearm back down onto the table. I'm so sorry, you startled me and I didn't hear you come in. Mai frowned at him, not the slightest bit disturbed by what had just happened. If she hadn't died yet from her own babies exploding, many of which Madraya had recently saved her from, then she wasn't worried about him grabbing a sidearm when he was so clearly scared of something. What's going on, Madraya? What's got you so spooked? Izuku shook his head. Nothing. It's nothing. I just came in early to finish these chipsets. Hatsum frowned at him, now really looking at him. His eyes were ringed in black like a raccoon, his skin was a sallow, sickly shade that, didn't fit him, and while his breathing was starting to calm, it was still ragged, as if he had just run several miles. Madraya. When was the last time you slept? Ate something? You've been pushing recently for the completion of something or another. But you've not said anything to me as to its exact nature. Do these chips have something to do with it? Hatsum gestured to the slew of chips in, various states of completion. Midraya rubbed his brows and then his eyes, sighing. Uh, just after I got back from the police station. After the Delhi incident, my mother and I had dinner. Izuku chuckled, she was really worried since the news outlets said villain attack for the first day or so. And to answer your other question, yes, those do have a lot to do with it. Those will, when complete. Allow me to finish the final stage of this little endeavor. Izuku looked up to find Hatsum staring at him, both impressed and utterly horrified. Madraya. That was a week and a half ago. Hatsum shook her head and stepped over to her desk. She pulled a protein bar from the drawer before throwing it straight at his head. They were the kind designed for people with heavy calorie, quirks. As such, it was just what the doctor ordered. It pegged him in between the eyes before he could stop and catch it. That right there should show you how out of it you are. You would normally never get hit like that. Now you are going to eat that bar and then lay down for some sleep. Hatsum cut him off before he could argue with her. Pointing her finger at him, you are about to drop from, both exhaustion and food deprivation. I'll finish these while you get some rest. Don't you have class, Hatsum? Izuku was already unwrapping the bar and biting into it. While he didn't want to admit it, she was right. He was worn down. Hell, he'd let his flashback get the better of him to the point that he'd drawn a weapon on her for God's sakes. Besides that, he had seen Hatsum pissed only, once. He had no interest in that happening again. Nothing that I can't afford to miss. Besides that, whatever this project of yours is, it seems important to you. 
even if I told you that I was going to be breaking multiple laws when I finish said project. Hatsum turned and looked as Yuku in the eyes critically before shaking her head. If it's you, I'm sure you have a good reason for doing so, I trust you, Midraya. Besides, you're my partner, right? In for a penny, in for a pound after all. And Midraya? Just call me my. Midraya was surprised. He knew she trusted him when she had begun sharing her workspace with him, but this was different. Is Yuku smiled at her, small tears forming in the corners of his eyes before he bit them back. Thanks. That means a lot. Is Yuku sat down on the, sad old futon, and before he could say another word, as soon as his rear touched futon, he was out like a light. Hatsum put her back against the wall now, looking at his sleeping form. What has him so spooked? He can probably lift a car at this point without much trouble. Hell, for that matter, what is he? Even I can't go a week and a half without dropping. Hatsum was still debating this when, her mother stuck her head in through the door to tell her to get moving. She caught sight of Izuku on the ground before pulling my outside. And who, might I ask, is that? Her mother practically purred the words at her and just generally had that look about her. The one that screamed that she wanted to know absolutely everything. For as great as her mother was, when it came to her children's romance, she could be utterly overbearing. That, mother, is my business partner, Midraya is Yuku. I found him working and practically about to collapse from overwork. Which I know is rich coming from me. Mai frowned and looked back at the door, concern etching itself into her face. Could you do me a favor and tell the school I won't be coming in today? Something's not right and I want to be here, to deal with it. Her mother had stopped her girlish jittering now. She tooted Mai's face closely. She had never seen her girl this concerned for another person outside of their family. Her girl had also never considered taking a business partner before. She knew what she was worth and knew others couldn't match up. How did you meet him? She was calm now when she asked the question. This one was, entirely serious. My smirked and looked back at her mother, just knowing that she would love this. He was the one cleaning up the beach like I told you guys about. I tried to brain him with my wrench and we got to talking. Her mother sighed. She had known that it had to be weird if it was my. Then she shook her head. I'll go call you in. Do what you need to do. And my? It was her turn to, smirk at her daughter, you tried to brain him with a heavy metal object and he's still working with you? Don't let him get away. Mai was already heading back into the garage, so her mother didn't get to see the scarlet that was blooming across her daughter's face. Mai initially spent time just studying the chipsets that had been completed. Once again. Izuku had created something ingenious and, blew her away. The amount he was able to cram onto this board made it obvious that most of the pieces were custom made. No one made pieces this small because no one knew how to make pieces this small and have them still be functional. After she was confident that she had spent enough time with Midraya's design to start putting them together, she began piecing parts together. It became quickly. Apparent that Midraya's eyesight had to be enhanced like her own because she was barely managing with both her quirk and the magnifying glasses that had previously been on Midraya's face. Just how many secrets is he hiding? Hatsum took the glasses off and rubbed her eyes after completing the second to last. She swiveled in her chair to look at his Yuku asleep, he had managed to go from his calm, sleeping position to one where he was curled into a small ball the pain on his face starkly contrasting the peaceful one he'd had barely an hour before. It was when he started to whimper like a kicked puppy that Mai couldn't sit there and do nothing anymore. But, unfortunately, she knew he needed his sleep. No matter how much she wanted to release him from the obvious hell he was in, she couldn't wake him. She sighed, sitting down beside him, and began rubbing small circles in his back. After Izuka woke up, he thanked Mai and told her that he needed to retrieve something from his home. He excused himself, assuring her that he would be back once he'd retrieved what he needed from his workbench. Hatsum agreed to finish off the last two chipsets while, he was gone. When Izuku got back, 
he came in with two things that Hatsum had not expected to see him with. One was a black, unlabeled case used to transport delicate electronics that he held in his hands. The other, she recognized as an art tube, was slung over his shoulder. In their case, though, they tended more to be used to store and transport important blueprints than art. Izuku spoke up, after he set the case down on one of the work tables and started to clear space on the one with their blueprint. I know you said you trust me, my, and I am incredibly thankful for that. But let me make something clear. What I said earlier about breaking the law. I wasn't joking with you. What I am preparing to do will violate about half a dozen surveillance laws on their own, much less the, others. This is your last chance out. Hatsum shook her head before crossing the room and clapping her hand down on Izuku's shoulder. I wasn't kidding either, Madraya. If it's you, then I'm quite sure you have a reason for doing it. You're my partner. That means we're in this together to the end of whatever crazy hole we're about to jump down. Midraya chuckled at that before turning and, clicking the black case on the table open. All right then. Let's catch you up to speed. Izuku opened the box and took a tablet out of the case, powering it up and tapping in a series of passcodes, a fingerprint scan, and even a retinal scan while he explained. You asked what I've been up to this last week? I've been building an information network deep enough that I won't be surprised again. I suppose that's we now, though. We won't be surprised again. Izuku smiled at that. A happy, full face smile that warmed the air itself and made everyone else feel fuzzy just for having seen it. She had only seen it a few times, but it always felt like her heart stopped when she did. Before she could wonder why that was, Izuku turned the tablet around, handing it to her and continuing his explanation. Every camera and database, Basically, anything that I could get into, I've been tapping and compiling into one large information network. Almost everything I could get into from here to Tokyo is now accessible from that tablet, as well as my workstation at home. To say that Hatsum was shocked was an understatement. What Izuku had just handed her was second only to what was likely, the government's information network. Even if it were a limited area. The implications of him having been able to set this all up in the last week were terrifying. Meanwhile, these little babies, which you just finished the last piece of, are the pieces the resistance of the project, for now. What is Yuku held up in front of her was barely any larger than her pinky nail and looked at her with a, sleek, gray gleam of metal and lens. These little things are barely 8 millimeters wide and boast an 8 megapixel camera. Fully automated and manually directed when the need arises, these will fill the gaps in the surveillance net. But first, I'll be giving them an important little task. Do you remember what I said about my old school? It took Maya a moment to find her voice, so she merely nodded. It was basically a hellhole, yeah? Bunch of quirkiest assholes making the weak slivs miserable because they can, right? Izuku shook his head. For the most part. Yeah. Though I left out some of the darker details. They once found a student that was afraid of the dark. They proceeded to lock him in the janitor's closet with no light until he had screamed his throat raw and torn up his hands trying to claw his way out of the closet. Izuku was seething with fury and Mike could see the hatred in his eyes. The best part about it? When the teachers found out what happened. They laughed. Izuku practically spat the word. They laughed and left the kid there. He didn't get out until the janitor found him at the end of the day. Izuku breathed deep, doing his best to calm himself, and Mai placed the tablet onto the table before sitting down. That was beyond anything she could have imagined. She had imagined that the students had been assholes, sure, but she had never imagined they were that bad. Or would have ever imagined in a million years that the teachers were willing participants in it. Izuku snorted. That's just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to Aldra. Their star pupil is a kid who is proud to think that he put me in a coma for a year. Hero material, my ass. Izuku huffed before continuing. His tone when he did made Hatsum's skin crawl. There was something dangerous there, like a large animal hunting its prey. 
the principal oh so graciously allowed me to leave the school without expelling me, after I broke said student's nose, on the condition that I don't go to, the police. Izuku smiled now, a sharp smile full of malice. Oh, I won't go to the police. But that doesn't mean that a certain detective won't find a nice little anonymous package of videos detailing precisely what goes on in that school. Hatsum moved slowly now to place her hand on Midrayu's arm. So that's what you've been working on this past week? A surveillance network and spy cameras to dissolve your old school? Not to belittle, but that hardly seems like it had to be so pressing as to run yourself into the ground. Izuku let the hatred slip away as if it were a cloak he was shedding. That, in and of itself, would have put her on edge were at anyone else. No, no. I got sidetracked. I'm sorry. That is more of a side project and a happy benefit from the network. The reason I wanted, it in place, and the reason I wanted us to not be surprised, is for two reasons. First. I would like to be able to help people like Mr. Fuji last week before it gets to that point. I wanted to have the ability to find them first and decide if I need to get involved. Secondly, it's because of this. Izuku shrugged the tube off his shoulder now, extending it to Hatsum, gesturing for her to take it. You put your trust in me, and that's a two-way street. It's time to put my trust in you, as well. You're right. You're my partner. So here's what I would like our first major project to be. Izuku let Hatsum take the tube from him and watched as she gingerly removed the cap before pulling out a series of blueprints. It only took her a few moments to realize what she was looking at before her, had snapped to Izuku. Midraya, if this works, she looked back to the blueprints again before shaking her head and placing her hands down on the desk around them. Who am I kidding? It's your design. We'll probably have to do some minor tweaks, but it's going to work. Midraya, this is a game changer. I'm not talking sliced bread here, either. This is a complete paradigm shift to the very, fundamental layers of our society. This will completely change how everything is done. Power grids, national security, hell, even household appliances. Hatsum looked from blueprint to blueprint. We're going to need more than just what we have here if we are going to pull this off. Hatsum looked up at Izuku with a gleam in her eyes that was that mad glint of invention that Midraya had become, so familiar with. I hope you're ready to clear the beach in its entirety, because that's the amount of usable material we're talking about here. Midraya smirked and rolled his shoulders, looking down at the plans on the table for a variety of sizes of fusion reactors if you're ready to get to work. Then I am too. Let's get to it. And my? Just call me as Yuku. When as Yuku opened his eyes that morning, he realized that they might have been overdoing it. In the last couple of days since he had given the plans to Hatsum, they had made a shocking amount of progress. Her, with tweaking his blueprints, God he was glad he had found someone with a mechanical background like my, and the paperwork involved with building a prototype reactor in a garage. The city, really wasn't particularly happy about that idea, but Hatsum's lawyer of a mother had ripped through them like a shark when they tried to block her daughter. Izuku, on the other hand, had been cleaning and pulling every possible piece of usable scrap from the beach and breaking it down into its base parts. They were going to need every piece of usable material and then some. After multiple days, of work on that beach all day, however, Izuku's muscles were not happy with him. Sure, he was quite happy with them. He was just about back to the point he had been at during his spec ops days, but his muscles were certainly telling him to take a day. After both his morning routine and a wonderful breakfast with his mother, he gave her confirmation that, yes, he would indeed be careful today. He, made his way to the garage workshop that he and Hatsum were working out of to find her mother swatting at her with one hand while berating her. I do not care how important this project of yours is. You still have to attend your classes if you want to graduate. I've given you the last couple of days because I can see that it's something big you two have got going, but enough is enough here. You, need to know when to take a break from your work. Izuku sweat dropped at the scene, 
and Mai was barely even defending herself against her mother's onslaught. Izuku let out a slight cough to catch the attention of the two ladies, and when they caught sight of him, they had two very different reactions. Mai, relieved to see him, bolted behind him, immediately using him as a human shield against her, mother. Mrs. Hatsum gave him an absolutely uncanny smile that was far too much tooth for his liking. Izuku shuddered, thinking that if this was how she acted in a courtroom, then he could see why she was considered one of the best defense lawyers in the country. Sorry, Mai, I'm with your mother on this one. I was stopping by to tell you that I need to let my muscles rest for the day. Besides, that, we both know the dangers of staring at anything too long. Blueprints, code, simulations, it doesn't matter, and we can't risk even a small mistake with one of these reactors. One of these goes critical. We're not talking about the garage getting its windows blown out. We're talking Mujurafu being wiped off the map. Izuku eased her away from her hiding position behind him so that she was, looking him in the eyes while he was talking. She huffed but finally agreed, taking her leave of both of them to get ready. You know you're the only one her age I've seen able to talk to her like that? Outside of our family, no one, and I mean no one, is able to get her to do things like that. Even we struggle sometimes to get her to do things. But you... Your words carry more weight than all of, ours. Look out for her please. Izuku hadn't expected Mrs. Hatsum to say as much, but he didn't feel as caught off guard as he would have expected. On that front, you don't have to worry. She's a brilliant girl, and I can assure you her words carry as much weight with me as mine do with her. Izuku stepped to the side of the desk, picking up a sleek black unmarked case. Then back to the doorway. I have somewhere I need to be, ma'am, so if you'll excuse me. Izuku turned to leave and muttered the last part to himself. I'm certainly not going to lose another. It had been two weeks since he had been to the music store to get his strings, and after Izuku had made his way there from the train station, he was glad to see the deli had quickly replaced its stores and gotten back to serving, its customers. It was pretty good food, after all. It would be a real shame if they'd had to stay closed. Izuku entered the store much the same way he had before, this time carrying a case rather than a guitar. Izuku approached the shop counter expecting to see one of the Jiro family manning it and, instead, finding a store worker a little older than him. The man was about 5 foot 8 and, somewhere in the ballpark of 19 or 20 by Izuku's estimates. His name tag labeled him as Tajima. He had brown hair down to his neckline and was wearing a smile that felt more forced than natural when he spoke. Hello, welcome to Don't Fret. Is there something I can help you with today, sir? Izuku shook his head, thanking him but asking if any of the Jiro's were around today, as he had, several matters he needed to discuss with the family. The atmosphere changed when he mentioned the family. The clerk, seemingly not wanting him to meet the family. I'm not sure. They aren't always around so you'll have to try again at a law as Yuku glanced past him when movement came from a door leading into the back. As he did so, he locked eyes with Kyoka as the door closed. There was a brief, moment of silence as they stared at each other and the clerk was awkwardly caught in his sentence. That moment was broken when Jiro launched herself across the counter yelling, Midraya. Izuku barely had time to catch her and set her down before she was ushering him into the back, berating him for not coming by sooner and how her parents had started to lose hope that he would be back after what had happened. So preoccupied was she with her savior that she didn't notice the clerk glaring at the two of them. The Jiro's were ecstatic to see that he had returned and, after they had settled down in the break room with tea, wasted no time in bombarding him with questions. He answered what he could and generally made small talk with them. Eventually, the parents had to get back to what they were doing before he came. Before they could, he asked them to stay for one thing. Izuku placed a strip down on the table that Hatsume and he had been working on. I was asked to relay this footage to you from interested parties. As it turns out, someone has been lurking around your store after hours and they wanted you to be aware. Izuku hit a button on his phone and the strip lit up, projecting, 
a hologram of a video into the air just above it. Of course, no one had asked Izuku to relay the message. Instead, it was simply something he had flagged to come up with an alert in his surveillance program. It wasn't perfect, but it caught quite a bit. The underground heroes swept most of what he had caught up, but there was still plenty of activity that they didn't. I'll have to talk to Mai. About working with me on creating a logistics vi for us after the reactors are finished. The Jiros were obviously put into a state of shock. Not just that some creepy person was lurking around their shop, which was upsetting for a plethora of reasons, but that the video was being projected in crisp high quality in the air in front of them. The parents, after breaking out of their stupor, thanked Izuku and, taking a copy of the video, left the room. Jiro looked from Izuku to the strip still sitting on the table, twirling one of her jacks with her finger. So, is this little strip what had you busy these two weeks? Izuku chuckled and shook his head. Picking up the strip and turning it over to fiddle with some of the circuitry with a small tool he'd taken out of the case. Not at all, this has been more of a little side project I've been working on in spare moments. Mostly I've been working on too much larger projects with my business partner. We're almost to the prototyping stage, so we're taking a break from that today. Izuku placed the strip back down on the table and his two back in the case. She couldn't see what was in the case, but she could tell from the sound of metal brushing on metal when he put the tool back that there was something larger in the cast than just the strip and some tools. For a time, they spoke of nothing. Inane things that would numb the mind as much as they made you smile. Jokes and stories that made them both relax, for a while forgetting their worries. After a while, Jiro circled back around to what they had been speaking of before, the incident several weeks ago. Seemingly out of nowhere, she spouted out with, I've decided I'm going to be a hero. Izuku smiled now, his voice soft, remembering the last time they'd had this discussion. I see you made your decision then. What made up your mind in the end? Jiro looked down and fiddled with her jacks. It was actually the incident last week. For a while, I was stuck thinking. About what happened. How close I came to not being able to make that decision and how badly I froze up. I wanted to be angry at that man for nearly killing me, for injuring you. Then after that, I wanted to be angry with death arms. If he hadn't run in like that, you would have defused the situation and nothing would have gone wrong. Kyoka's face was pensive and she was hesitating, speaking, softly. She slowly shook her head, I am going to become a hero so that those kinds of situations can be resolved the right way. Not like how Death Arms handled it. Izuku sighed as he listened to Jiro's reason to be a hero. He wouldn't discourage her, of course but he didn't know if she had thought it all the way through, either. Did she realize that if the situation had gone differently, he would have resorted to force? Did she realize that he would have killed the man to keep everyone else safe if the situation had called for it? Was she prepared to take that step if she had to? He buried those thoughts and smiled, congratulating her on figuring out what she wanted to do and offering her to strength train with him down at the beach. She could meet his partner, as well, the image of a small, remote village smoldering flashed across his mind before he shook his head. She has plenty of time before she should have to think about these things. As Izuku walked down the road, he sent a message to Mai, telling her that he was on his way to his second task. When he felt his phone buzz in his hand, he expected it to be Hatsum continuing to gripe at him regarding her, classes being useless. Instead, he found it was Jiro verifying the time to meet him at the beach and what to expect. He smiled at her message. She seemed like she was taking this seriously. They had another three years before their entrance exams. His 15th birthday had just rolled around, and his mother had made it readily apparent with her tears what she thought of that. The fact that her son, who should have been a freshman in high school, was in the process of finalizing his senior year did not pass by her. Nor, for that matter, had it passed by Mai, who had been incessantly hounding her mother to let her do the same. Perhaps if she was willing to socialize with Jiro, then they'd be able to convince Mrs. Hatsum to let that happen. Izuku looked up from his phone as he rounded the 
final corner to his destination. The line of duty. Pro Hero Snipes personal range and shop. The shop mostly catered to professionals, so there was a clientele consisting of police, military, and a handful of pro heroes from Japan and overseas. That isn't to say that civilians couldn't go there, but quirks had made most people forget about firearms. Izuku stepped into the store and decided there, was no way he was in the wrong place, despite the name sounding vaguely like the name of a bar for cops. The shop floor was filled with cases of accessories for both people and their weapons. Gun cases, safes, cleaning gear, and tactical clothing were towards the entrance, while in the back of the shop were glass counters filled with an assortment of sidearms and knives. No rifles for sale, but, that's not terribly shocking. Even if the rules for sidearms relaxed and you can get the license for rifles, that doesn't mean they're typically sold to civilians. Izuku walked up to the counter and caught the attention of a clerk. When she came over, he gave her a smile. Hello, ma'am. I made an appointment to speak with Snipe today following his arrival. You'll find me under Madraya Izuku, the clerk at the counter frowned. Aren't you a tad bit young to have an appointment with the woman cut herself off? While she was indeed surprised, she was anything if not professional, and his name was indeed in the appointment log. I apologize, sir, I didn't realize that you were so young. If you come with me I'll take you right back. Izuku nodded his head and followed the young woman past, the range. At this time of the day and week, it didn't surprise Izuku for there to be more booths than shooters currently. When the clerk knocked on the office door, she informed the hero that his appointment had arrived, then ushered Izuku through the door before returning to her place. The hero in question was sitting behind his desk, still in his costume, the old school tan gas mask covering, his facial features and keeping Izuka from reading him. That doesn't mean that he couldn't see Snipe's shock in the way his body tensed when he walked in. Izuku gave him a smile and began to cross the room to take a seat. While he did so, Snipe spoke in the well-known southern drawl that announced him as having spent time in the reunited states. I've gotta say, when the detective went and referred, someone to me as a favor, I certainly hadn't expected someone as young as you are. He shifted in his seat and Izuku placed his case down next to him in the chair. Izuku gave Snipe a small, professional smile. Yes, well, the good detective owed me a favor so I asked him to refer me. Or are you telling me that you would have allowed a 15-year-old to make an appointment with you at a gun, range? Snipe shook his head. Aye. I can see your point. And for that reason, let's get to your point, what are you here for? Izuku straightened himself and held up two fingers. I've come with two requests. The first would be to allow me to take the licensing examination for handgun carry. There was a tense silence following this statement. Not that Izuku could see it, but several emotions had gone across Snipe's face at that and his eyebrows had settled into a scrunch that was certain to give him a headache if he held it. I can't say we have a tendency to issue carry licenses to minors. You also can't tell me that you haven't issued them before. Izuku and Snipe stared each other down for a few moments before Izuku finally sighed. No, I didn't figure you would, but it was worth the chance. The second is to get this serialized. Izuku picked up and placed his case onto the desk now, sliding it across to him. Snipe was confused. Izuku was sure of that much. There was a slight head tilt when he pushed the case across the desk and hesitation when Snipe reached for it. Snipe opened the case and pulled out the handgun that Izuku had pressed against Mai's throat only a few days, prior. He drew the slide on it back, checking for a chamber drowned before snapping it forward and pointing it at the wall of his office after he had cleared the barrel. He looked back at his Yuku and placed the gun onto the desk. Where did you get this from? Snipe asked him, clearly wary of where his Yuku may have gotten an unserialized sidearm. I made it myself recently in preparation for hopefully, getting my license to carry it. Snipe was quiet for a moment before he stood taking two boxes and several magazines from a drawer in his desk. He pushed Izuku's sidearm back to him before gesturing him to follow. As they walked, 
Snipe spoke. In light of you being a gunsmith, I'm gonna give you a chance. That box has 50, 130 grain rounds in it. You're gonna load your magazines, with them both and complete a simulation cycle of my choosing. You pass and I'll give you a license to both carry and conceal on one more condition. They both steeped through into a room with a single booth looking down at a firing range. I'm gonna program the simulation now. At random targets will appear down the range. Circle means target and a square means civilian. Generally, squares would be, just points deducted. In this case, it'll fail you if you hit it. Load up and signal when you're ready. Izuku nodded, he had expected he would have to fire his sidearm to get licensed, so this wasn't too much of a stretch. Even if he hadn't expected to have to pass a simulation to do it. He stepped up to the booth and began loading his magazines. As he finished placing them neatly on the table in front of him, he put in his earplugs, and when he was ready, he signaled Snipe to begin the simulation. Snipe had done a lot in his life, and as a pro hero, he had seen a hell of a lot more. When the kid had come into his office, at first his instincts had screamed at him to draw his weapon. He hadn't because it was a kid. When the kid had asked to get licensed and stared him down, he could feel a pressure coming from this 15-year-old that he generally hadn't felt since he last met some of the old soldiers hardened by the first Gork Wars. Then finally, he had seen the handgun that the boy had apparently machined himself. He wasn't lying to him, he could tell that much. He had decided to give him this chance for two reasons. First was because if the boy passed, he would be offering him a position as a gunsmith for them. He hadn't seen craftsmanship like that in some time, and gunsmiths were in short supply in this day and age. The second was because something about this boy was setting off alarms in his head, and he had learned to trust his instincts. So there Snipe stood, regretting having programmed the simulation to as high a level as he did. He had let that little irrational feeling worry him into setting the simulation to a level that he doubted even he would have been able to complete before his graduation from UA that sense of regret only lasted as long as it took Izuku to begin shooting. He hit the start button and the boy took his stance. The targets started flashing up at a pace that would have most shooters dizzy and they only picked up the pace, randomly throwing civilians, targets, and targets over the shoulder of civilians up into the range. Never once did the boy miss. Never once did the boy put more than one bullet into a target. Never once did the boy miss the center mark on each target and never once did the boy even so much as clip a civilian. When the simulation ended and all 100 rounds were put down range, the boy, expertly ejected his last magazine, pulled the slide back on his sidearm, and set it down, muzzle pointed down range. He then turned around, once again in parade dressed and waited for Snipe to come out of the control room and tell him his results. I have to say, I haven't seen shooting like that in quite a while. Your quirk must have something to do with accuracy like mine MR right? The boy gave, him a confused look as he said as much. Sir? Didn't you read my file that the detective sent over with the referral? I'm quirkless. It took only a moment for the implications of that to sink in before Snipe felt all of the blood drain from his face. Izuku turned when he had finished the simulation, taking his earplugs out. He didn't think it was his best shooting he had ever done, but he felt that it would suffice for what Snipe was looking for. Snipe came out and immediately asked him a question. I have to say, I haven't seen shooting like that in quite a while. Your quirk must have something to do with accuracy like mine MR right? Izuka was confused. He had had Namasa send his information with the referral so that he wouldn't be surprised when someone under a teen walked, into his office. Sir, didn't you read my file that the detective sent over with the referral? I'm quirkless. Snipe was quiet for another long moment, just staring at Izuku's confused face before he turned and sat down with his head in his hands. When he looked back up at his Yuku, he was back to normal. All right, you passed. I will, as I stated, give you your licenses. That is on the condition that you come in every Tuesday of an inn and help as a gunsmith. 
We currently only have one gunsmith on staff and I'll have to say as much as I love guns, servicing them all myself can be painful. This can be for as long as you're willing to help. That being said, I would prefer it if you were to come in for at least the next couple of months since we're coming up on hunting season. We're gonna have a lot of work to do in that time. Izuku thought about it for a second then nodded his head, putting his hand out to shake. He could do through hunting season. Mai wouldn't be happy that he had other things to do on Tuesday, but it was a small price to pay for his gun licenses. And kid, if you don't mind me asking, what is it that you plan on doing in the future? Izuku gave him a sad smile now. I plan on getting a hero license, sir. Why he would be sad about that was beyond snipe, but he had no doubt the kid would manage it. To which he could only think one thing. Thank God. By the time Izuku got out of the store and range, the sun was already going down. He had let time get away from him when he was in the range and, as such, had to take his licenses and get going, promising that he would return Tuesday, unless something came up. Everything had gone well that day. All of his tasks for his rest day had been ticked off his list, though he still felt like he was forgetting something. When he got home to his mother with the sign arm now in its holster under his left arm, he very quickly remembered what that something was. Who was that? Snipe nearly jumped a dozen feet in the air when a racer heads, voice came from behind him. Goddamn partner try not to sneak up on someone like that. Nearly gave me a heart attack. Snipe had locked the door behind Midraya as he was leaving. When Eraser had gotten into the building, he had no clue. To answer your question, I just licensed him for carry and hired him on as a temp gunsmith. Azawa's eyebrow shot up at this. Snipe, I've known you for quite some time, and in that time, you've issued maybe three carry licenses to minors and those were all under extreme circumstances. Is this kid someone I need to keep an eye on? Snipe shook his head. Nah the kid actually plans on getting a hero license. But the reason I licensed him is for two reasons aside from that. 1. He's apparently a damn good gunsmith and I need one of those. Second is, that I ran him through my personal gauntlet and he passed. Azawa could consider himself impressed at that. He had seen what Snipe considered to be a normal run on his gauntlet settings. What did the kid score? Snipe looked him dead in the eyes and with full seriousness said, Perfect. All Aizawa could do was stare at him in silence and disbelief, the sun beamed down on the beach, giving Izuku ample reason to despise the sun. The sand was doing its job in retaining that heat, making the air around him a scorching 102 degrees Fahrenheit. The only relief that Izuku got was the occasional breeze coming off of the ocean, cooling his sweat-slicked skin. Hatsume had decided that until they got a sufficient amount of raw material, for her to begin piecing parts together, she was going to help him. Her hair had grown out recently, and since she hadn't had time to get it cut with her obsessive focus on the project, she currently had her hair pulled back into a tight ponytail, much like Madraya kept his. She was in shorts and a tank top with a bandana placed over her head but had insisted all the same on wearing her combat boots. How she was managing, Izuku had no idea. He had long since discarded his shirt and was merely in his shorts and shoes. He supposed it helped that she was dismantling scrap into core components while he was lugging heavy objects, either to her to dismantle or to the dump site. The beach, itself, they were making solid progress on. Now that he had someone stripping parts for him, he could focus more on simply clearing. About 35% of the beach had been cleared by his estimates. And it would, hopefully, pick up pace even further once Jiro joined in. Speaking of which, she should be getting there right around. Izuku heard footsteps approaching the beach from where he was tossing the trash into one of the dumpsters. Now, Izuku set down the rest in the bin and then turned to meet Jiro. Hey there, Jiro, Izuku called out to her as she stood by the wall, staring in disbelief down at the beach. Whether due to the mountains of trash or due to the amount they had already cleared, he wasn't sure. She had evidently followed his message that morning about the temperature and worn light workout clothing. 
Just how much trash is down there? There's a beach under all of, that? Izuku chuckled. It did indeed seem overwhelming initially. They had already cleared a 40 by 20 rectangle out of the beach. It's not that bad. Only about two stories of various refuse. We've already cleared out about 24,000 cubic feet of trash, so what's remaining is already a lot less than we started with. Follow me and I'll introduce you to my partner. Izuku smiled, and gestured to her to follow. Hey, my. Izuku yelled across the beach as they walked over. My, who was bent over an engine bay disassembling, grunted back at him. He had brought that car over to her early this morning and she was only just now getting to it. One moment, Izuku. I dropped one of my tools and it fell to the bottom. I'm seeing if I can reach oh god damn it. The soft tink of, metal on metal followed by a short thud inclined Izuku to believe the tool had just fallen through to the sand. He chuckled and walked up, tapping Mai on the shoulder to get her to shift back. She stepped back, shoulders hunched, and pouted. I could have gotten it, you know. I'm sure you could, Mai. But it's easier this way since it's on the ground now. Izuku grabbed the front of the car and, lifted it up onto its back fender long enough for Mai to pick up her wrench. She huffed and thanked him before turning around to their guest. She had been prepared to play nice like Izuku had asked and introduce herself. That was until she saw Jiro with her jaw practically on the ground. All she could do was laugh after that. Jiro looked between Izuku, Mai, the vehicle, and back to Izuku, in that, order. You have a strength augmentation quirk? I always wondered why the definition in your arms was, well, so defined. Jiro nodded her head as if she was finally understanding. That was until Izuku's face became pained and Mai started to laugh even harder. Jiro ignored the girl now crying and looked to Izuku for an explanation. I don't have a strength augmentation quirk, Jiro. In fact, I have no quirk at all. Izuku was wincing when he said it. He may be fine with his quirklessness now. But that didn't mean that he was unaware of how people tended to react to the quirkless. As if they were a diseased leper in a society of immunodeficient. Jiro went back to being absolutely shocked before sputtering and simply pointing between the car and his yuku. My, panting, finally spoke up. His, muscle and bone density are so far beyond what a normal human being should have, he could probably lift three or four of those at this point. Hell. Yeah. That's not even the craziest thing I've seen him do recently. I'm starting to find the idea that he's entirely human to be a joke. Neither girl saw how Izuku winced back as if he had been slapped at that. Mai wiped the tears out of the corner of her eyes and extended her hand to Jiro. Hatsune Mai. I'm Izuku's business partner. Izuku smiled seeing Mai actually interacting with another person willingly. Even if he hadn't planned on announcing his quirkless status, it was worth it if this was the outcome. I'm going to let you two get acquainted. Jiro, when you're ready to get started, grab me. I'll show you an area with smaller pieces that you can start with. Izuku narrowed his eyes. Now that he thought about it. Jiro, have you had any formal combat training? Martial arts? Wrestling? Boxing? Anything at all? Kyoka blinked at the question and shook her head. No, I can't say I have. Is it important? Her jacks were twitching and she was nervous. Was she supposed to have had some kind of training? Izuku nodded. All right, then I'm going to start training you on that, as well. We'll take some time later to get you started on the basics. You are going to be joining us, too, Mai. Mai's head snapped back to Izuku. She had gotten distracted with a part and was only now, that is Yuku said her name, really processing what they were talking about. What? Mai squeaked. She was startled by the idea. She was going to be a support, technician. Why did she need to know how to fight? Why am I being dragged into this? Her, I understand. She gestured to Jiro with her screwdriver. But I'm going to be staying in my lab. Why would I need to know how to fight? Izuku turned his narrowed gaze on her. That is exactly why you need to know how. 
Mai tilted her head and even Jiro was giving him a confused look. He sighed, let me put, it this way. If you were fighting a war against an overwhelming enemy, where do you start targeting? Infrastructure, civilians, supply lines, industry. What does that have to do with Mai cut herself off, eyes widening as she came to the realization as Yuka was looking for? Exactly. If I were a villain? The first group I target and get rid of are the support technicians. They are the, scientists. The creators. They are the lifeblood of the supply, the industry. Now I'm not saying you are going to get attacked, my. In fact, we're lucky, as most people labeled villains are just petty criminals. They won't go after technicians because they aren't concerned with the big picture. An organization though? They would. What happens when we introduce our prototype, as well? You think, companies won't send people after us? Mai raised her hands in defeat. Fine. Fine. I get it. I'll join in later. Her mouth was dry and she reached for her water. She hadn't thought about it, but it made sense. Izuku nodded his head, then slipped into a small smile. Back to a lighter topic. Like I said, Jiro, I'll train you later. When you're ready to get to the smaller pieces, grab me. He, walked away at this point, picking up a fridge that had already been stripped of all its usable pieces. His muscles flexed under his skin, and the sun glinted off his tanned skin from many days in the sun. He had the body of a Greek demigod, and as he walked away, Jiro let out a low whistle. Good lord, green is fucking jacked. Jiro was muttering to herself, but evidently Mai had heard her because she snorted at the statement. Yeah don't even know the half of it. When he really gets working at the forge. He's shirtless, sweaty, and hammering a piece of heated steel. Mai shuddered and shook her head slightly. It's kind of terrifying honestly. But. In a good way, you know? Jiro looked back to where Madraya was now carrying the fridge up the stairs with ease. Yeah, yeah, I get, that. I get that really well. The sun was setting when Jiro's back hit the sand. She was exhausted. Midrayu made it look easy, and his idea of light was incredibly skewed. Then following that hellish muscle training in the guise of cleanup came the combat training. Initially, it hadn't been that bad. It started with Midrayu explaining basic strengthening techniques for the muscle groups that, weren't targeted by their cleaning. After that, it had been the basics of the basics. How to properly throw a punch, kick, and block. What she hadn't been expecting was the routine that came along with that. Repeat and to repeat of the same movements made her aware of muscles she didn't even know she had. When she finally caught her breath, she set out towards the train station to head home. Izuku, had said he'd follow her home to make sure she got there alright. When she protested, he stated that it was just convenient timing since he had business over in town that way. She shrugged, since she didn't mind the company, anyway. As they sat down on the train, she groaned. How she was going to get back up at her stop, she had no idea. How the hell do you do that every day, Midraya? I did, less than you were doing and I can barely walk. And I'm certain that I will be feeling it worse tomorrow. Well. I can't exactly claim that I'm the most normal person you should be comparing yourself to, Jiro. She narrowed her eyes at him, scrutinizing his expression. Just how abnormal are you? Enough, was his only reply before they sank into a companionable silence. When Jiro and Izuku were almost back to her home, she asked him a question. Madraya. What you said earlier to Hatsum. About support technicians being in danger. Were you telling the truth? I am a lot of things, Jiro. But a liar is not one of them. He had a sad expression and distant eyes, as if recalling something long ago. But yes, to answer your question. Support technicians are, generally very well protected behind multiple layers of security. It's one of the major reasons I Island was created. But I know all too well how easy it is to slip past security if one has a reason to. I want her to be able to protect herself if worse comes to worst. Jiro could understand that. A million things could go wrong, and there was no harm in being prepared, 
After all, I doubt I'll be able to join you guys again tomorrow. I'm pretty sure I'm going to have to wake up and take a painkiller as it is. I wouldn't want you to, anyway. Nothing against you but you're not used to this, and straining your muscles too far will only do the opposite of what we want. I'm fairly confident you'll be able to tell when you should and shouldn't be joining us. Here's your stop. Is Yuku smiled at, her. It was great to have you along. I'm sure my will warm up to you soon enough. She honestly socialized better than I expected her to. Jiro laughed. She looked like she wanted to beat me with her wrench every time I got near the pile of materials she was working on. Yes, well, that's already better than most. The first time she met me she actually tried to hit me with her wrench, so, Izuku smiled and waited for her to be fully inside before turning around and letting the smile drop off his face. You can come out now. I know you're there. There was nothing but heavy silence that greeted Madriya's comment. But Izuku knew someone was there. He had been able to send someone following them since they got off the train. Fine, if that's how we want to play this. Izuku let all of the guards he had put up slip away. His personality flipping as if a light switch had been flicked. His eyes glowed a bright viridian, and cyan specks floated around them. It was bright, and anyone looking would think that a demon was staring back at them. He flexed, rolling his shoulders and popping his neck, the promise of violence practically radiating off of him now. Let me make something, very clear. He growled to the silence. You can come after me all you want. I don't care what you do there. But if you go after one of mine? There will be no pit in hell deep enough that you can escape me. It took a moment, but the presence faded, and as Yuku sighed, letting the light in his eyes recede back into his normal emerald. That had been an unexpected encounter tonight, but he still had, one more thing to do before he could head home. Hopefully, it could be dealt with quickly. His mother would be late getting home tonight, and he really wanted to have dinner with her. It didn't take long to find the man he was looking for. Even if he didn't have what was basically an inescapable web of cameras to pull from, the man didn't exactly do subtle very well. He had fallen into step, behind the man for a few blocks before following him into an alley. Izuku hadn't made any attempt to disguise that he was following the man. He had wanted this confrontation. After all, who are you and what do you want? The man snarled at him, as if his Yuku had kicked his dog. Cerulean fire lit in his hands, climbing his arms in an attempt to scare his Yuku. The fire lit the alleyway in a ghostly, hue, outlining that the man in front of him was not healthy. He had more burnt tissue than should be on anybody and a haunted look that told his Yuku the information he had gathered was correct. Izuku parted his hands to either side of him, a universal symbol that he came in peace. Midraya Izuku. What I want is you, Dobby. The man looked down at him with suspicion in his gaze. And what would a kid, need with a hardened criminal like me? He still hadn't put the flames out, but he seemed less tense. Izuku just chuckled. If a series of small break-ins where you took only the bare minimum is what you consider to be a hard crime, then you need to relearn what it means to be a criminal, Totoraki Toya. Izuku gave an icy smile that reflected the look in his eyes that were once again glowing. Dobby, once on the verge of relaxing, felt his tension immediately spike through the roof, his flames burning brighter than they had been a moment before, and subconsciously he shifted into a combat position. This kid is dangerous. How the hell does he know who I am? How long has he been watching me? Izuku waved at him in a motion of dismissal. Relax. I'm not one of your father's goons, and while, I doubt I hate him as much as you do, I have no love for our illustrious number two. Izuku let a bit of venom leach into his voice when speaking of endeavor. Generally, he wouldn't let his opinions seep so clearly into his tone, but he had a feeling it would help in this situation. As for how I know who you are, yes, you are that obvious. It isn't hard to figure out when you have an entire city's databanks at your disposal. You should just be glad that the police never tasked anyone actually competent to your missing person case. Great. Now I know I have to worry about someone finding me still. 
You still haven't answered what you want from me. Dobby was on edge. He couldn't get a read on this kid. He clearly wasn't a cop, and he clearly wasn't a hero. But he wasn't a villain, either. Even if his blood had run cold under that gaze and his instincts were screaming at him to run. Izuku gave him a wide smile now. Dobby felt another chill run down his spine. There was a predator in this alley. And it wasn't him. Oh no, you don't need to worry about anyone else finding you. I scrubbed all trackable information from the systems for you. Think of it as a peace offering, considering how I've ambushed you like this. As for what I want? It's simple, really. I want to offer you a job. I know you're looking for one. No one is willing to hire you for a variety of reasons. The place you applied to earlier ripped up your application, by the way. Don't bother waiting for a call from them. Dobby cursed under his breath. He'd had a good feeling about that one, too. The man, must have been faking nice. As far as they were concerned, they all saw a burned, sketchy man that had no real history. Hell, he was barely making it by as it was, and he was getting kind of sick of sleeping in stairwells. What kind of a job and why would I want it? Izuku smiled now for real. They both knew that he had him. It's quite simple, really. You see people out there, like yourself, need, help. Sometimes it's something small. Moving a couch, finding a lost cat, beating the shit out of a stalker. Other times, it might be something bigger. Escaping from an abusive husband and getting them to an extraction location, returning a stolen item to its rightful owner, beating up several bigger stalkers. I'll pay you a flat fee for each, varying based on the task at hand with a potential. Bonus if you can handle the situation without incident. You'll handle the situation and, in return, they'll owe me a favor down the line. Izuku's smile was hard and vicious at that last point. In this coming year, I'll be setting up a facility of sorts. I'll then be transitioning you to head of security for that facility. At that point, you will be paid a salaried wage, and if you would like, you can stop doing the contracts entirely. And why would you want me for this? There are others more capable, surely. Izuku shook his head. Certainly that might be the case, but you are special. You know both sides of this. You have a criminal mind, but you aren't past the point of no return. What you've done can be expunged from the system. Besides that, you know the hero's side, as well. Oh, don't get me wrong. People like us? We aren't heroes even if we have a license saying otherwise. We operate in a gray zone that people don't like to think about. But it's a chance for you to do good, despite everything you've been through. Dobby thought about it, staring intently at the boy. No, not a boy. Demon in front of him. He knew too much, spoke too well, and played the game like a pro. He was right, of course, and he couldn't exactly pass up an offer this good. Dobby nodded his head slowly, agreeing to the offer, and let his flames fade out. It was like everything the boy had said and done up to this point had been an act. His smile dimmed into a proper, soft one, and the creature that was hunting him before was gone, as if it had never existed. He shuddered at the easy, transition. The kid wished him good night, turned, and walked out of the alleyway. It wasn't until his phone buzzed in his pocket with a list of contracts and their commission prices that he decided he had just sold his soul to the devil, Izuku sat at his desk, slowly twirling his pin through his fingers. It was early enough in the morning that Izuku couldn't head into the workshop without risking either disturbing someone or worrying his mother. Instead, he sat there, staring at his screen that was covered in informatics. It had become evident to him that he would need a source of funding early on. Sure, they could make a vast, majority of the parts they needed from the beach scrap, but there were certain critical pieces that he would not risk being faulty. Besides that, there were tools, daily expenses, and now, Dobby's commissions. Which, Izuka was happy to note, were being completed at a rather judicious pace. He had been surprised at the discretion with which Dobby was able to operate when given the incentive. Not, displeased, certainly. Just surprised. As such, 
he was spending this particular ungodly hour of the morning playing the American stock market like a fiddle. There was plenty of short-term money to be made from the daily playing of stocks. It had taken him a bit to actually establish the accounts to do so, but now that he had them, he wouldn't really have to worry about their funding when in, conjunction with his other method of gathering funds. One would be surprised at just how many bank accounts out there belonged to dead people, wherein the banks couldn't touch the funds and the families didn't know or think about them. Was it the most ethical? Oh, most certainly not. But as Yuka wasn't about to let that get to him. After all, they couldn't use it, and if it was just going to sit, there, then he had better uses for it. So here as Yuku sat, twirling away as info flittered by. He rubbed his eyes and stretched, before deciding he needed some fresh air. Looking at the clock, he decided that he had just enough time for a quick snack on the roof before he would have to finish out his final bids and prepare for the day. He went to the kitchen, grabbed a bottle of water and a granola, bar, and made his way to the fire escape. He had spent a lot of time up on the roof when he was younger. For him, it was a place he could get away to. One where he could look out over the city without anything, or anyone, to worry about. There as Yuku sat, the sun just preparing to crest the horizon and warm the city in its golden glow, and simply watched the lights of the city glow in the twilight, deep breaths of morning air and the faint rays of morning light had nearly worked their wonders on his disturbed psyche when a light set of bootsteps landed on the roof behind him. Out of everyone that is Yuku had encountered since returning to Japan, the person behind him certainly rated the highest in terms of both mobility and stealth if they just came from the roof beside theirs. The footsteps, were slowly making their way towards him when he spoke to the noise. If you are attempting to sneak up on me then I must say you are the closest to someone capable of it that I've met recently. The noise stopped and as Yuku glanced over his shoulder. There he saw what he might have considered to be the single most exhausted human being he had ever seen. Standing around six feet, the man looked, like an absolute mess. Black hair cascaded to his shoulders in a waterfall that disappeared behind a coil of what appeared to be a scarf. He wore black from head to toe with a belt of pouches around his waist. The man had stopped when he had spoken to him and was now taking him in, a careful look on his face. What are you doing up here, kid? Shouldn't you be asleep? It's nearly five in the morning. It was clear the man was wary of him. The kid recognized the man through the footage he was always surveying, of course. One of the few heroes that still had his respect, Eraserhead didn't do it for the media attention. In fact, he actively went out of his way to avoid it. Izuku waved his hand in circles around the air, gesturing at nothing while still leaning against one of the roof, edges. I'm just catching some air. I live down below. It's been a long night, and I wanted to see the sunrise before heading into the workshop. How about you join me? If I had to guess, you've not had a moment's rest all night, either. The man was still cautious, of course, but had relaxed considerably upon hearing him to be a resident of the building. He leaned against the edge of the roof, beside the kid. The kid was a curiosity, Aizawa decided. He recognized him from the line of duty. Snipe had given him the kid's file when he had asked to see it, so he knew the kid was only 15. Yet, standing there with the kid on the rooftop awaiting the first rays of the day, he didn't see a teenager. If it was possible, he saw someone that was as tired as himself. Not the kind of bodily, tiredness that he was so used to dealing with but a kind of weariness that sank into the very spirit of a person. They were only there for a few minutes, simply relaxing in the peace of the moment when the first golden rays peeked over the horizon. For the first time since the boy asked Tezawa to join him, he spoke. In the first warming rays of the sun's ascent, we find a self-evident truth, that every day is a fresh start, a new chapter in this saga we call life. And knowing that, we can be happy knowing each day is a gift. Midraya sighed and stretched, before turning and heading back towards the fire escape. He stepped over to the edge and was preparing to drop down to the landing when he stopped. Go home and get some sleep, eraser. 
I'm sure Hisashi is worried about you after, last night. Aizawa jerked as if he had just been stabbed by a cattle prod. How did the kid know about the raid he was part of? How does he know about Hisashi? But by the time his brain had caught up with the shock, the kid was already gone. Midraya is Yuku, just who are you? Is Yuku had a problem. He had been carrying the final parts they needed to finish the prototype reactor to the workshop. The problem arose when he got to the door and realized that there was no way he was going to be able to open it without putting the parts down, and frankly that thought annoyed him for some odd reason. He kicked the door several times to try to get Hatsum's attention, to no avail. He was just about to kick in the door when happily, for the door, Hatsum opened it. She went bug-eyed when she saw his, knee up and chambered and dove back into the workshop, as if she had just seen the fist of God itself coming down on her. Which, considering how training had been going for her since they'd started sparring, she might actually have seen her life flash before her eyes. Relax, my, I have no plans on attacking you at random. Not only would it not serve as effective training, but it would also just, make you paranoid. Izuku stepped into the workshop with his pile of boxes and set them down in a corner. That's the last of the parts we'll need for the prototype. Also, Izuku tossed a box to Mai. She stumbled but managed to catch it. Merry Christmas five months early. Mai was confused until she opened the box to find everything she would need to put together a kit for plasma arc welding. She, jerked her head up, thanking Madraya profusely before narrowing her eyes at him. Are you only giving me this because we need it for the reactor? Absolutely. Otherwise, you'd be waiting the extra five months for it. Izuka was already grabbing pieces out of the boxes and putting them aside in the order they would be needed. Hatsum chuckled and rolled her shoulders. Today was going to be a good, day for science. Jiro had seen a lot of strange things since becoming friends with Madraya. She'd seen him, quirkless lift an entire car as if it were made of aluminum foil. She had seen Hatsum almost blow them up with items that shouldn't even have been able to catch fire, much less blow up. So when the heavy metal door of the two's garage went flying off its hinges fast enough to embed it, in the concrete across from it, Jiro wished she could say she was surprised. The noise of the metal door slamming into the concrete still made her jump, but surprised she was not. The two people in question stepped out of the garage with a mixture of expressions. Wonderment, surprise, and Jiro narrowed her eyes because she was fairly certain that was a fervent joy. To Kyoka, they looked like, lunatic mad scientists one would see in old movies. Their hair was sticking practically on end and their eyes had this crazy energy to them. The image certainly wasn't disproven when the two looked from her, to the door, and then at each other only to then start cackling maniacally. What the hell is going on here? Why is the door now part of the concrete? Izuku wiped the tears out of the corner, of his eyes, hair still standing up, and choked out a response. We completely and utterly underestimated the electrical field that would be generated by the reactor when we turned it on. It polarized all of the metal in the room and launched it away. In the case of our tools, they're all stuck to the walls, in the case of the door, well. He went back to laughing and Jiro looked to Mai, who was, finally getting herself under control. Jiro's expression must have been enough to say that she was still confused, because Hatsum finished the explanation. We accidentally turned everything in the room into magnets. Because of that, the reactor flung absolutely everything away from it. In the case of the door, because of the size of the now magnetized door, it was launched far harder than, everything else. Jiro shook her head and was about to retort on why the two smartest people she knew didn't anticipate this when she realized what it meant had happened. You got it working? The reactor is operational. Hatsum's smile was wide and crazy, while Murdryas would have been tempered by the knowledge that he would be the one fixing the heavy door now embedded in the concrete, retaining wall, had the two of them, of course not just revolutionized practically everything. Izuku told them to wait a moment while he went inside and turned the reactor off. He didn't have to tell them when it was off, as the loud clang of metal indicated when he had. 
Jiro stepped inside to find the garage an absolute disaster area. Every single thing with metal in it that wasn't the reactor had been, practically launched at the walls. Despite this, the two crazies acted like nothing was wrong and were both hunched over their blueprints, acting as if a reactor hadn't almost destroyed their workshop only moments before. Uh. Not to downplay the massive accomplishment you both just achieved, but why did you call me here? We all know I won't be much help with, Jiro waved her hand around, gesturing to the workshop, all of this. She was confused. While she had certainly been at their workshop before when she helped them carry materials or met them here before heading to the beach, they had never called her here without a reason. Midraya looked up from the blueprints on the desk. The crazed look he had been sporting until now faded into a warm one. Ah, yes, you are correct. We, didn't call here just to witness this. Though it is a happy coincidence that we got the prototype working for your appearance. As Yuka walked away from their blueprints to one of the several device storage containers they kept in the corner of the garage. After a moment, Izuku pulled a small silver case out of the container before closing the container and turning to Jiro. We both know that you, would rather be home with family right now, and you're welcome to go home after this. But these are from both of us. Happy birthday, Jiro. Izuku handed the silver case over to Kyoka despite her considerable surprise. When had he learned her birthday? When she opened the case, she was further both surprised and confused. There were two small, silver patch-like objects, as well as a nondescript, silver wristband. She looked up to Izuku and my smiling. These two, Midraya reached into the case and picked up the two small silver discs, go right here under your ears. Jiro's ear jacks twitched, and she could feel her face flare up as Izuku reached his hands back behind her ears and put the discs in place. Meanwhile, this goes here on your wrist. He placed the band on her wrist before, pressing a button and having it conform to its new home. They, together, serve multiple purposes. First, I noticed your interest in the holotech we've been working on. Your wrist unit wirelessly connects to any of your devices and will display anything from it in front of you, amongst other fun tidbits I'll let you find. The two discs behind your ears serve two purposes. The first is that any of the music you queue up from your device will play through them via bone conduction. We originally developed it for some of my future gear, but it works well in this case, as well. The second, more important, feature is one I think you'll be rather fond of. Jiro noticed Hatsum putting in earplugs and Izuku picking up two large pieces of metal too late to stop him. He slammed the two pieces of metal together hard enough to cause a gust of wind and the two rods to bend. Instinctively, Jiro stepped back and was putting her hands up towards her ears when she realized that they weren't bleeding from the sound wave. Izuku smiled at her shock while Hatsum spoke up. The two discs will modulate any sound over a certain decibel threshold down to a more tolerable level. Izuku noticed you, flinching at some of the louder noises around us and mentioned we had the tech to fix that issue. We just barely managed to get them done for today. Jiro was in shock. She knew the two were her friends, but to go to this extent? She hadn't realized that they cared enough to notice, much less help her with her issues. My suddenly tensed when she saw Jiro start to cry. What, what's wrong? What, happened? Did we do something wrong, Izuku? Izuku shook his head, smiling, and Jiro laughed, wiping at her eyes. No, my. We did something right. Jiro spent some time with them after she had pulled herself back together. Hatsum's mother had stopped by and exclaimed in shock that Jiro was actually real. They had all laughed at that, and eventually Jiro chose to go home and spend the time with, her family. Izuka was on his back under the reactor, tweaking part of it, when Mai bit her lip, debating on whether or not to bother Izuka with her plan. Finally, she decided they were partners, and he would need to be in on this. Izuku, could you come out of there for a moment? He slid out from under. A bit of black had been smeared from somewhere across his nose, and he had an eyebrow quirked, up at her. What's up, Mai? He set his tools aside and dusted himself off, 
standing and walking over to the desk where she was. She was nervous, he noted, concerned. It wasn't like her to be acting so apprehensive. Well, I've been thinking for a while, and we're going to make a lot of money when we announce this. Like I said before, this is revolutionary. But up until this point, we've been, calling each other business partners but haven't, you know, made it official. So I thought that maybe. You know. She pulled out what is you could have recognized as a crude floor plan for a workshop with a company name scrawled messily at the top of it. She was fidgeting in place and blushing, clearly waiting on a response from him. He looked at it for a second before giving her a smile. It's a good name, but I think I can do you one better on this front. He gestured to the paper before walking over to the containers. From them. He pulled the same black tube he had delivered the reactor blueprints in all that time ago. He twisted the cap off and, much to Mai's surprise, pulled another full set of blueprints from the tube. This time, however, when he sat them down on the desk, he immediately, scrawled the name she had on her paper across the top of it. Her mouth opened and closed in surprise as she looked over what appeared to be a detailed floor plan of a now-named company building. She looked up at him and was met by the same warm, wide smile she had begun to associate with him. Is this what I think it is? Why do you have this? What? He laughed for the umpteenth time that day and, thought how good it was to have friends he could laugh with again. I had been thinking of the same thing for a while. Though I hadn't come up with a name that described the two of us so perfectly, I did map out a floor plan and found a plot of land where we can build. If. Of course, it looks good to you, partner. Hatsum snapped out of her shock and looked up at his yuku. Meeting him was the best, thing that had happened to her, by far, and this only cemented it. They got back to work finishing their prototype and figuring out how they were going to introduce it to the world. But never did the blueprints for Moonlit Industries move from the top of their blueprint desk.